So this, the workshop which was held on 15th of February was a feedback session regarding the lessons learned after the adoption of the proposed curriculum. In the organization of the past workshops, ACM Nagpur chapter gratefully acknowledges the support received uh, from Padma Shri Dr. Vikas Mahatme, member of Rajya Sabha and an eminent ophthalmologist of the city. On 16th of February, yesterday, the 12th Inter-Research Institute Student Seminar IRIS 2018, a conference of the research scholars in various institutes in the country was organized at Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Vishweshwarya National Institute of Technology, VNIT Nagpur. In this a keynote address by Professor Y. Narhari of Department of Computer Science and Automation, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, was, uh, was organized. After this, the ACM India Best PhD Thesis Award winner, Dr. Palash De, presented his work. This was followed by 14 oral presentations and 20 poster sessions by research scholars from all over the country. On 16 February itself, a meeting of the ACM women scientists and academicians was held at Cummins College of Engineering for Women. Um, along with IRIS, there were presentations by industry professionals regarding what are the research uh, uh, activities which are followed in various uh, industries from Microsoft research, from persistent systems, from TCS research, and other uh, institutes, other organizations of the country. The main event today, which is the culmination of this year's ACM India celebration, and in this we are really fortunate to have four stalwarts as the keynote speakers today, and I'm I am sure everybody, all of us are really eager to listen to them. We are thankful to the keynote speakers who have spared time to visit Nagpur to enlighten us with their knowledge and vision. We are also thankful to the ACM president and ACM CEO for their, for their gracious presence for this event. We have received a great response to this event with participation from academicians and industry from all over the country. And there is great enthusiasm amongst the institutions in and around Nagpur towards these celebrations. Once again, on behalf of the ACM Nagpur professional chapter, on behalf of Venki and Persistent Systems, I welcome everybody to the Nagpur city for this uh, ACM India main event and welcome you all. Thank you very much. Uh, now I request uh, Rashmi Mohan to please come on stage and uh, guide us through this presentation. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the ACM India annual event for 2018. It's wonderful to see such a full auditorium. I'm sure it's very exciting for you all to be here and be a part of the, the proceedings um, that we've planned for today. I'm Rashmi Mohan, ACM India Secretary. Um, and thank you for welcome, uh, welcoming us to this beautiful city of Nagpur. Uh, we hear that we're a little early for the orange season, so next time we'll plan the event better and make sure we're here in the right time. Um, we're very thankful. Um, we'd like to express our gratitude to the Nagpur professional chapter of ACM, um, VNIT, YCCE, Persistent Systems, and Cummins College of Engineering for hosting all these events. Um, things have been running so efficiently and smoothly um, that we've, it's been an absolute pleasure. ACM India is built on the foundation of many professional and student chapters across the country. This past year has been a great success for ACM India. Hosting many diverse and deeply technical events, uh, we've been able to strengthen and bolster the CS community in India thanks to these chapters. I'd like to invite Professor Madhavan Mukund, ACM India President, to provide us with a report of the wonderful things that ACM India has been able to achieve this past year. Please welcome Professor Mukum.
Thank you, Rashmi. Uh, so on behalf of ACM India, I would like to, at the risk of repeating everything, welcome all of you and thank the local organizers and thank all the uh, keynote speakers and uh, others who have traveled a long way for this event. So uh, my brief at this point is to uh, tell you a little bit about ACM India. You will also hear more from uh, Vicky Hansen about ACM itself. So, so ACM India is uh, a relatively new organization. It was formally inaugurated in 2010 and it is overseen by an ACM India Council which is elected by ACM members. So every two years we have an election and the members serve for four year terms. So broadly, uh, when ACM India started, uh, we had three different directions in which we were going to work with computing in India. So one is obviously education and research. Uh, the other one is to build a better bridge between academia and India's well-known IT industry and see how computing as a science could be uh, linked between the two. And the third, which is I think equally important is that I think computer science in India lacks uh, a kind of place in government policy because it falls between many different schools between e electronics and and uh, business and so on. So broadly speaking, our ambition is to be the voice of the Indian computing community and bring together all the people who play a role in influencing how things happen and make things better for everybody. So one of the activities that we started with was the research board because the primary uh, obvious thing that became clear was that you know we didn't have uh, enough research output measurable compared to the size of our educational institutions, the size of our industry. So the research board, uh, one of the uh, uh, activities is to organize a doctoral dissertation award for PhD theses in computer science in India. This has been going on since 2012 and we will have the presentation for this year at the end of this uh, morning inauguration. Uh, we also uh, have a kind of fact-finding survey where we poll institutions throughout the country and try to get an estimate of how many students have completed PhDs and in what areas and what they are doing. So this little green graph, which I have been forced to put in by PJ Narayanan, is a picture to show some of the data that we have. So the good news is that the PhD production is going up, but the bad news is that it's not really going up in absolute terms as fast as we would like. But uh, we have also tried to bring academic in events to India, major conferences like um, uh, the Software Engineering Conference, ICSI, then Programming Languages, POPL, VLDB, the database conference. And uh, in co cooperation with the Indian Association for Research in Computing Science, IARCS, ACM provides travel grants to students who present papers at uh, well-known international conferences. And with Microsoft Research India, we have, for the last uh, three years, we actually started this in 2013 and there was a break, but the last three years it's been a regular event where we bring together uh, people from different research groups with a theme and invite people from uh, both faculty and PhD students together to have some discussion about activities going on in India in terms of research. Uh, so this kind of, it is an academic meeting, but there's also sessions to discuss uh, issues and how to take things forward. So after we tackled research, we realized that of course you have to feed research through a uh, well-structured teaching program. And uh, one of the difficulties is that the level of teaching computer science is quite uneven across the country and uh, outside a few well-known uh, top institutions, it's very unclear uh, what level of instruction is imparted. So one of the activities that uh, was taken up was to set up an education committee uh, so the education committee does many things. So one of them is to work on this curriculum. There are a lot of factors involved. I mean, prescribing a curriculum is easy. Training people to teach it is harder and even harder is to get administrative bodies like uh, boards of studies to adopt changes. So all these things are things in work in progress. CS Patshala is a very recent initiative. I'll talk about it a little later, which is aimed at an even younger audience at schools and teaching computational thinking in schools. Uh, we have also been looking at how to be more effective about updating faculty and getting them to be more insightful researchers and teachers in particular. So we are trying to build up a portal with resources that faculty can use both for teaching and for assessment. 
Last year, we started summer schools for senior undergraduates, third year students, to try and promote the idea of researchers as a career. And this has been quite well received, both by the students and the faculty who attended and taught in these schools. And another related activity which we launched last year, which was yet to mature, is that we tried to set up a, a kind of simple programming test to measure the outcome of our education, because there have been a lot of uh, anecdotal complaints from the industry about students not being well trained. So just to see whether they have, at the end of a computer science uh, degree, whether they have reasonable programming skills or not. So an important activity for ACM worldwide and for ACM in India is ACMW, which addresses issues primarily faced by women in computing. So ACMW has an India council and organizes activities specific to this theme in India. So sometimes these are technical symposia. They could be just sessions where women academics or professionals share their experiences about difficulties they face. There have been hackathons arranged e exclusively for women students, coding competitions, and so on. So there is a separate annual celebration for women in computing, which will be held this year in Bangalore in June. The last one was in Chennai in September. And there are also going to be local celebrations throughout the country. Uh, ACM India also co-presents, along with the Anita Bald Foundation, the Grace Hopper Conference in India, which is usually held in November or December, which is again aimed at uh, women, mostly women professionals rather than people from academia. So uh, you will hear about, and most of you know about ACM's role as a overall uh, generator of scientific knowledge, and uh, this is largely done through special interest groups and conferences which they organize, and of course there are associated journals. So in India we have three, at the moment, active branches of special interest groups uh, on software engineering, knowledge discovery, and data mining, and a more recent one which is computer science education. And we also have, as uh, Rashmi mentioned, uh, chapters which, like the Nagpur chapter which is hosting this event, which organize activities locally of interest to uh, students, faculty, professionals in that area. We have also have student chapters in campuses. We have ACMW chapters. We have a chapter summit where these chapters come and report on what they're doing. And uh, we have instituted in parallel with ACM's Distinguished Speaker Program, an Indian version called the Eminent Speaker Program, where these chapters can invite people who are empaneled to come and give lectures, and ACM India will uh, help arrange the uh, logistics for this. So the third arm is uh, talking to industry and government. Uh, so we have had some uh, interactions with the government. Uh, so we had a Digital India event when VLDB was organized in Delhi two years ago. And that uh, later that year, we also had a summit on the interface between technology and startups at the NASCOM conclave in Bangalore. And the last two years, the Ministry for Human Resource Development has organized a Smart India Hackathon, which tries to uh, engage students from campuses across the country to work on problems which have been proposed and defined by various government ministries and government agencies. And ACM India is involved in the evaluation of this hackathon last year and this year as well. So I mentioned. Uh, taking computing to schools. So CS Patshala is an initiative which is now less than two years old, started in the middle of 2016. And uh, at the moment, the target is the younger classes where schools have a little more autonomy before it comes to the board time. And though it was only launched uh, about a year and three quarters ago, it has already reached out to a large number of schools in terms of pilot implementations. And more critically, it has also resulted in a very large body of teachers being trained. So to be a sustainable effort, it cannot be delivered from outside. So more than 600 teachers have been trained in the new material. And going forward, uh, we hope that we will eventually have enough uh, data from the performance of these schools to convince national policy that there should be a an introduction to computing in schools in the same way that everybody in schools has a basic exposure to mathematics, science, history, and so on. That this is an important aspect which students should learn and learn in, in somewhat, quote unquote, the right way. So another surprising, to us at least, 
outcome is that within this relatively short time, CS Patshala has got noticed and we actually have been invited uh, by some state government uh, bodies to participate in pilots in government schools and which they will organize but take the material from CS Patshala. And we've also become involved in some efforts which are going on to rewrite uh, the curriculum and textbooks at school level at CBSE and NCRT. So this is all very moving quite well and moving very fast. And I think it's been one of the big successes of uh, ACM India in the last couple of years. So to wind up, uh, let me just reiterate that our mission in ACM India is to become the voice that reflects the wishes, aspirations, and goals of the Indian computing community across all aspects of computing. So my message to all of you is that ACM is a volunteer activity. Everybody who has been organizing this event and all of us who take part do so out of our interest in promoting these things. So do take time from your busy lives to join us and help make yourself and ourselves heard. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Madhavan. That was very insightful. I'm sure you would all agree. Um, and I'd like to reiterate, I think uh, all of us here that participate in ACM are all volunteers. Um, but it's a very, very enriching experience. And the, um, the impact that you make by being a part of an organization, I mean, there's the learning that comes through it that we all benefit from. But the impact is also very great. So do consider becoming an ACM member and participating more actively in your local chapter or starting one if you don't already have one. So globally, ACM has strived to become, make more significant contributions both to practitioners and academicians. With new conferences and workshops, ACM is more relevant than ever before to the CS community globally. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Vicky Hansen, who's the ACM president, in walking us through the significant contributions that ACM has made um, to the global computing community. Wiki, please. Hello, everyone. Great, this is working. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. This is my second time being at the ACM India Council and this annual event. I want to thank the people from the council and the organizers of the event. You've done a fantastic job. You've made us feel very welcome. And this is truly going to be a great event. I have a wonderful lineup of speakers today, so I'm really looking forward to this. Okay, I'm here to tell you just a little bit about ACM and our activities, um, some of the major initiatives that we have going on. First off, to start, ACM is the oldest and the largest society for computing worldwide. We serve both professionals and students globally, and we reach these students and professionals uh, through our technical, scientific, and education activities. One of the things that we're really working on and the thing that we feature most prominently when we talk about our activities is that we see a world where computing helps solve tomorrow's problems and where we use knowledge and skills to advance the profession and make a positive impact. And you can see that statement. There we go. Um, if you go to the ACM homepage, you'll see that statement there in somewhat small print, but it is there. Um, the home page gives you a, an idea of some of the major activities that are happening at ACM at the moment. And you see the um, ACM India event featured very prominently there. As Rashmi 
already indicated, ACM um, is made possible, the activities of ACM are made possible um, due to volunteer activities. We have a wonderful headquarters staff that supports the volunteers in everything that we do. However, there wouldn't be any ACM activities if it weren't for the volunteers who make these activities happen and have new ideas. So like Rashmi, I'd like to encourage all of you to join ACM, get involved somehow, and get new activities going for the organization. There we go. OK. Um, this is just a map showing where ACM's members are located around the world. We are a global organization. About 50% of our members are in North America, as you can see. The other 50% come from around the world. There is a large number from India. Um, India is the fourth largest nation uh, in terms of our membership. And it is, we have a growing membership here. So whatever you're doing here in India, we thank you very much. It's working very well. Clearly, I'm not very good with this pointer here. Uh, okay, ACM has um, three regional councils around the world. Uh, we've already heard a lot about the ACM India Council from Madhavan. Uh, we also have councils in Europe and in China. And each of these councils has a very unique perspective. And they inform ACM about the activities that are important to the different regions. And they do take on many of their own activities that are independent from what um, happens with ACM as a whole. I, I really don't know what I do wrong with this pointer here. OK. Um, one of the main activities that ACM does is education activities. And with our education activities, ACM influences the teaching of computing worldwide, both in universities and at the pre-university level. We have a large number of education activities in terms of curriculum for computer science overall. We have a new curriculum for um, uh, security. Let's see if I, oh, I didn't do that. OK, a new curriculum for security. And um, for primary schools, we have an organization called Computer Science Teachers Association that is working with teachers for uh, the younger students to get them involved in computing activities. We have 37 special interest groups. So no matter what your technical area of interest is, we would have a special interest group that is relevant to you. So if you're interested in high performance computing, for example, programming languages, graphics, um, education, as we've already talked about, uh, theory, human-computer interaction, many of these different activities, there's a special interest group for you that would have their own conferences and activities. And in fact, our conferences um, provide a lot of the literature of the computing field. Okay. Um, our global conferences happen, as you can see, everywhere really around the world. This is a map. Um, it's available from ACM's digital library. You can constantly get it updated, see where the conferences for ACM were held within the past 12 months. We hold more than 200 conferences, workshops, and symposia every year. Um, well, as you can see the spread, several of them do happen to be included in India. These uh, proceedings from the conferences are put in the ACM Digital Library. The ACM Digital Library is really probably the greatest collection of computing literature in the field. Um, I had some statistics here I wanted to read. Um, last year alone, there were 29,000 new articles that were submitted into the digital library. Um, 602 new volumes came from our conferences. There's 48 journals that ACM has. 
and eight magazines. The flagship magazine is shown here on the bottom right, Communications of ACM. This is a publication that all members of ACM get. Um, our immediate past editor-in-chief, Moshe Vardy, is sitting here. He was editor-in-chief for about 10 years, which was an amazing accomplishment. He just passed on the, the torch recently, a few months ago. So thank you, Moshe, for all that. For practitioners, uh, we have uh, a series of magazines called Q. This presents up-to-date information that will help practitioners with their day-to-day -day work. Um, very timely information. And also, there have been a new series of workshops that have been started um, on AI and blockchain. These are starting a, a new kind of format for ACM, looking at local meetups to see if this is a, a method that will be more effective for practitioners getting together and sharing information, but also, as I said, focusing on the important topic of AI and blockchain. For practitioners, practitioners, we also have a wonderful webinar series. This is also good for researchers, but it's put on by the practitioners board. Uh, the learning webinars are something that anyone can sign up to. They are free. You don't have to be a member. Um, these are announced on the, the ACM website. Look for the Learning Center. Uh, if they're not held at a time that you're able to be there live, all of these webinars are recorded, and so you can go back and listen to them later. Some of our recent speakers include Fei-Fei Li, who talked about artificial intelligence. Um, there's a picture there of uh, Silvio McCauley, who talked about blockchain, and a recent speaker was Jay Gambetta, who gave a talk about quantum computing. So you can see that uh, we have the webinars on a wide range of interesting and current topics. I think everybody knows about the ACM Awards program, right? Uh, we do, well here it says, celebrating innovation and recognizing achievements of lasting contributions. Of these, the most well-known would of course be our Turing program. There we go. Um, we have two of our Turing laureates presenting today. We have Bob Tarjan and Marty Hellman, who will be giving talks today. Uh, the Turing Award is the greatest achievement in computing. It's often called the Nobel Prize of Computing. This past year marked 50 years since the beginning of the Turing Award. And ACM celebrated it by having a series of um, articles and events all about the Turing Award. Uh, the highlight of this was the Turing 50th celebration that happened in June, where we brought together about 27 of the Turing laureates, including both Bob and Marty, who were there. There was a day and a half of panel talks, other presentations, um, honoring the achievements of these remarkable people. The panel talks were very interesting. I made a note of some of the topics. Um, we were looking at some of the hot topics in computing these days, um, including advancing deep neural networks, restructuring personal privacy, quantum computing, and ethics. These panels were really fascinating. They had experts in the field. Uh, they were also all video recorded. And you can find them if you go to the AACM website and just search for uh, Turing 50th. You'll be able to find the link that gets you to these different panels that you can watch. Okay. One other thing on the Turing 50th. The other thing that happened was there were a series of videos that were presented during the event that were interviews with the laureates, asking them about different topics. Uh, my personal favorite was the one called On Methodology, where they interviewed the laureates about what had inspired them to do their work over the years, what kept them going, um, often in the face of setbacks. Um, it, it's a great video. As a teacher, I use it often in my classes. Uh, it's just a few minutes long. You can also find all these videos on the ACM website. You want to go to, you want to search for retrospective videos from ACM's Turing 50th celebration, and you can find all these videos with the interviews of the laureates. 
Okay, I want to talk just about a few of ACM's um, other key activities that are going on these days. One of the things that we're very excited about is the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. This brings together Turing laureates and laureates in mathematics. So the mathematicians are Fields Medal winners, Obel Award recipients, and um, Novellino Award recipients. Last year we added the ACM Prize awardees. The ACM Prize awardees are people who are like mid-career that have done amazing achievements in computing already. So the, Her the uh, Heidelberg Laureate Forum brings together for a week these laureates in computing and mathematics for a week of lectures by these luminaries. But in addition, it brings together 200 young researchers. These are undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs beginning their career. And the amazing thing about this particular event is that the laureates so freely give of their time to talk to the new researchers to get them going. It's very inspirational to the young people. Uh, unfortunately, the deadline for application for the next one just passed a few days ago. When I was looking this up, I was sorry about that. But um, there will be another one next year, so I would encourage you, if you're a student, to look for this. If, if you have students, uh, next January, start looking for this application form, because they do accept people from all over the world to be the students. Yes. Another key activity for ACM at the moment is um, the Code of Ethics for Computing Professionals that's being rewritten. The last time it was written was like in 1992. A lot has happened since 1992. So it's being updated at the moment. Uh, right now, it's out for comment. If you go to the AACM website and search for this, um, you're able to put in your own comments, read through the Code of Ethics, see what you agree with, what you think might need to be changed, make your comments. Um, hopefully, the final version of the code will be out at the end of this year. But anyway, this is something out for review. This is about what all computing professionals should do, right? Okay, the last thing I'd like to mention is ACM's Future of Computing Academy. And this is all about empowering the next generation of computing leaders. Uh, we went out last year, um, put out a call, uh, this was international, uh, to find younger members of our community to talk to them about what they think is important for the future. What is it that ACM should be doing? How should we be conducting our business? So we're in the process of working with the 46 people who were selected during that time to really figure out what changes should be put into motion for ACM. There will be a call coming out maybe in another six months for an additional cohort of people to join this original 46, so something else to keep your eye out on uh, if you're interested in becoming part of this and influencing what ACM does and what computing does in the future because they are starting their own conferences and activities. Okay, so just, I, I, I know time is short, so I just want to say two things. Um, the first is that during my time as president, I've really worked to make ACM um, very welcoming and positive to the global com uh, computing community. Um, I've tried to um, make changes that would influence educators, professionals, and researchers. Um, this, my term as president is nearly done. Uh, as an elected president, you have two years. I have only a few more months to go. Uh, the new election for president will be starting very soon. But I'd just like to say that as president, I tried to make some changes to look at the future of the organization and how it would be successful, what kinds of changes we should make in the future. So I hope this is successful, and I look forward to those of you who are here now and other people worldwide to continue on with some of these initiatives. ACM is a great organization, and I hope you participate. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Vicky. Um, I thought it was especially um, exciting to be able to hear about all the resources that ACM has 
for all of us. Um, it would really be unfortunate if we weren't able to take advantage of some of the resources that we have. Um, I'd also like to say um, a special thank you to you for the two years as president. I think ACM India has benefited greatly from the, uh, from the inclusion and from the participation. Um, and so our deepest gratitude for that. Um, so moving on with the rest of the program. Um, the ACM India annual event is a time to felicitate and celebrate a most prestigious award, the Doctoral Dissertation Award sponsored by TCS. Through a very detailed and thorough evaluation of current PhD candidates, the judges have chosen a winner. I'd like to invite uh, Professor Himangi Kapoor, Professor Abhiram Ranade, and Professor Madhavan Mukund to walk us through the process of evaluation and announce the winner for this year. Good morning, everybody. I, on behalf of the ACM India Doctoral Dissertation Awards Committee, so our team consists of myself, uh, Abhiram, and Madhavan. So we are a team worked throughout the year to get this uh, through. So a brief report I'm going to present today. So um, um, just a brief um, slide on the award. What is it about? So this was established in 2011. And it recognizes the best doctoral dissertation award uh, from a degree awarding institution in India. And we start the academic year from 1st of August of a uh, year to 31st of July of the following year. Uh, the cash prize is uh, around 2 lakhs for the winner and up to rupees 1 lakh for honorable mentions if we find some deserving dissertations. And um, sponsorship is from TCS. So a report of 2018, uh, we received 23 nominations, out of which two were ruled out of scope. Uh, from the remaining 21, uh, they were thoroughly reviewed by a jury. So the, um, the jury is listed here. Um, Krishnandu Chakravarti is the uh, jury chair from Duke University. Then uh, we have Bhargav Bhattacharya from ISI Calcutta, Deba Malya Parinkrahi from Duke University, Parth Pandey from Washington State University, Paul Bogdan from University of Southern California, Supratik Chakravarti from IIT Bombay, uh, T. W. Kua from National Taiwan University, Robert Will, Johannes Kepler University, Austria, Moh Mukesh Mohania from IBM and Swarum Kumar from CMU. So these are the jury members and of course there were two to three other people associated with each of them to review the uh, thesis. After the complete process, uh, uh, this is the remark I've quoted from the jury chair so that there's no bias left from our ACM India team. This is what he has to say. So he said that after the review and discussions, they shortlisted five dissertations which were worthy of the award. And out of that, um, they discussed and chose the winner. And from the remaining, they chose two as honorable mentions. And the green portion is a proud event for ACM India that he said this year we had uh, more nominations compared to last year and the quality was also very superior. So that's uh, good news. and encouraging for the new generation of PhD students. Some acknowledgements. Uh, so ACM India definitely wants to give a big thank you to Professor Krishnendu Chakravarti for his continued support over the couple of years in the selection procedure. He is extremely busy, but still he does keep in touch. And then he, uh, I mean, I keep pestering him for the deadlines and he is very patient and keeps following with the reviewers. And it was a, a very good professional experience uh, for all of us to deal with all of them. Uh, then a big thank you to all the jury members and the reviewers without whom selection of quality dissertation is simply impossible. Finally, a big thank you to TCS for generously sponsoring the award every year. Um, so now to give away the awards, uh, I would request ACM President Vicky Hansen, uh, Madhavan Mukund, ACM India President, R. Venkatesh, Vice President uh, TCS, uh, to kindly come on the stage to give away the awards. Uh, 
right. So now the winners, uh, of course, they are advertised on the website already. I would request uh, the winner, Palash Day from IISC Bangalore, for his award winning thesis Resolving the Complexity of Some Fundamental Problems in Computational Social Science. Palash Day, please. He was advised by Professor Narahari and A. Bhattacharya. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, so he gets a flag, a certificate, and the check. A big round of applause for Palash Day for his very hard work, and thank you to his advisors also. Thank you, Palash. Next is the two honorable mention awards. The first one is uh, to Swagato Sanyal. Uh, he did his PhD from TIFR. Uh, the title was Complexity Measures for Boolean Functions, Fourier Sparse, Fourier Dimension, and Query Complexity, advised by Professor Prahlad Harsha. Unfortunately, he's not able to attend the event. We have the second honorable mention, Dr. Manoj Agarwal from IIT Bombay. So he's with us. Uh, the title of his thesis was uh, Data as Graph, Discovery, Search, and Retrieval, advised by Professor Kriti Ramamritam. So a round of applause for our second honorable mention, Manoj Agarwal. I would request um, Vicky Hansen to please hand over the plug, and Madhavan and Venkatesh to give the certificate and the chai. Thank you, everybody. I'd like to request you to stay on stage for one moment. The local chapter wants to hand over some mementos. Um, Dr. Himangi Kapoor, thank you. Dr. Vicky Hansen, Dr. Himangi Kapoor, Pro Professor Madhavan Mukun, <laughs> and Professor Abhiram Ranade. <laughs> Clearly, this was the unrehearsed part of the program. So. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. If you want to do something well, start early. That's what most people say. Our student chapters epitomize this phrase. As our most active and effective chapters, they infuse ACM with enthusiasm and never say never attitude. To honor their work and encourage their spirit, ACM presents the best student chapter award every year. I'd like to call Mr. Shekhar Sahasrabuddhe to do the honors this time. I'm sure you guys are waiting with bated breath to find out who it is. So by the time the slides get loaded, I request uh, Madhavan and Vicky to come on the stage again. <laughs> So when uh, ACM India started, actually we had uh, very few chapters. So four years back when the chapter number crossed 100, we decided to honor the best chapter, best student chapters with some acknowledgement and awards. So uh, this time we received entries from 27 student chapters. These are some of them listed here. Uh, then the professional chapters actually helped us to evaluate all these awards. So Basically, 16 judges from different professional chapters helped us, uh, jury members, to do the evaluations. These were the criteria uh, set for the evaluation. So the same criteria are used by ACM Global also to give away the awards. And uh, every year, actually, we give two awards, the winner and the runner-up. So this year, uh, there was very close competition. And then uh, we decided that we'll give one more award this year that is the Honorable Mention Award. So this year's Honorable Mention Award goes to Chitkara University ACM student chapters. So may I invite Chitkara University people to accept the award? The Honorable mention was Chitkara University and the runner up is PCCOE ACM student chapter. So PCCOE is actually Vimpri Chinswar College of Engineering. <laughs> And the winner, PICT ACM Pune chapter. So PICT is Pune Institute of Computer Technology.
So congratulations to all winners, runner-up, and special mention awardees. And thank you for all those 27 chapters who submitted the reports. And thank you, Madhavan and Vicky. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Shekhar. Um, the local chapter would like to honor you with a memento. And um, a huge round of congrats congratulations to the student chapters. I mean, you're dealing with exams and um, you know tests and hostel food, and to be able to do such good work besides all that uh, is really commendable. Um, we're coming to the close of the inauguration ceremony. Um, we'd just like to end with a very special thank you um, and a mention to ACM COO Pat Ryan for, and of course, um, all the other guests who've come from so far away despite their very busy travel schedules. Um, Ms. Pat, if you could please have you up on stage. We'd like to honor you. <laughs> Good morning again and welcome back to the session. What we are waiting for, the talks by uh, the Turing Award winners and other uh, top people in the field. It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. I am Professor P.J. Narayanan, Director of AAAT Hyderabad, but also the past past chair of ACM India. We are uh, about to listen to a talk by Professor Martin Hellman of the Diffie Hellman Key Exchange fame. I will not introduce him about where he got his PhD, which year, and all the usual things. I would like to say a few things which is separate from that. The public key cryptography or key exchange scheme that he devised in 1976 or around there is what makes a lot of things that we take for granted possible. Exchanging, talking in code, and saying things that your enemy cannot understand, but your people will understand. Encryption. This has been part of life, especially the military life, for centuries. But doing this, I mean, all, it of, all of it required people to meet, exchange a key using which you do the encryption, and if the key gets lost, you are in trouble, and so on. Public key cryptography or public key systems that... Uh, are you in use today, use the public and unsecure channels to exchange information between two people that only they, those two will know. So this is, a, this is a remarkable thing that you can use the un insecure public networks or public communication system and exchange things, exchange two secrets which both the parties have and nobody else has. And then they can use it to send messages. So the uh, Diffie and Hellman uh, devised this system, and whether we know it or not, this is what made e-commerce possible today. 30 or 40 years later, if you are exchanging our bank information, our accounts, doing commerce over internet, it's because of things that emanated from that work. We are working in, we are living in peace because of the work they did. Talking about peace, Professor Hellman is not only a computer scientist who has done all these things. His deep concern for other aspect has been evident from the very beginning. In 1980s, he was part of a group that was talking, the US academics talking with Russian academics or USSR academics. This is the height of the Cold War or the peak of Star Wars and the environment was hostile, but there was this channel of uh, scientists talking to each other and they came out with a book called Breakthrough, uh, Emerging New Thinking about security and so on. So security and peace has been in his mind. He officially became an emeritus professor at Stanford in 1996 and has been working on a few things, including global international order, peace, and uh, things related to that. He also has a 
has published a book with his wife Dorothy on relationship, whether it's between people or between nations or between entities, relationships that can relate to more peaceful world than world with contentions. So the deep humanities in him is equally impressive as the deep computer science that he has done. So I'm really looking forward to his talk and I'm sure all of you will be enlightened by this. I welcome uh, Professor Martin Hellman to give the next talk. No, I think I'll just use this microphone and then this is the slide projector here. Okay. Oh, I just turned it on. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And before I forget, I'm going to start my stopwatch. No, what's going on here? It changed its face. Oh, well, I'll hope that this works. <laughs> so uh, I should refer you, since I don't have time in this talk to go into everything I'd hoped to, uh, I'll refer you to my publications page at, on my Stanford website. Uh, and so if you do a web search on Hellman Stanford Publications, it should come right up, or if my home page comes up, just look for the publications page. And then the breakthrough book that uh, PJ mentioned is available as a free PDF. You can link right down there and load it, download it. The book my wife and I wrote, which is mostly about international and personal relationships is there, but also has some cryptography in it. You, if you search on RSA, you'll find that, for example. And that's also available as a free download. And also, the paper in, that I had, the write-up of my Turing lecture, that was in the December issue of the CACM, and uh, Moshe uh, Vardy, thank you for your help in getting that in. That's also available, and I appreciate that ACM lets me make that available uh, right on the website. Thank you. So for, check there for those other things. Uh, because of my interest in international order, international peace, reducing conflict, it's wonderful to be here in India and to see how India has advanced in so many ways because to make a better world, we have to make each nation better and economics is a key element of that. It's not all, but it's, if people are starving, they can't worry about the other things. I'd also like to draw attention to the pioneers from India who helped create this kind of interaction and the possibility for um, many of the things going on. For example, I, when I was at uh, Triple IT in Hyderabad with PJ, I learned that Raj Reddy, uh, the 1994 winner with Ed Feigenbaum of the Turing Award, played a crucial role, uh, an important role, and is on your board. I, even before coming here, I had in mind a fr good friend of mine, Thomas Kailath, who is in signal processing, so many of you may not have heard of him. But I'll tell you, when he came to MIT in 1957, he was the first Indian-born PhD student in electrical engineering. When I rode over in the car today, I was with a man who was at the University of Maryland, and I said, could you imagine the University of Maryland with no Indian students in computer science or electrical engineering? And uh, just I'll finish by noting that Tom not only create, helped create a bridge over which millions have then moved, and Raj and all these other pioneers, but also Tom was awarded the highest medal of honor in science and engineering in the United States by President Obama a few years ago, the National Medal of Science. And also in my introductory remarks, I'd like to talk to all the students out there. If you get into a research program and you find yourself thinking, I can't do this, who am I to think that I can make an original contribution to knowledge? I want to tell you that's how I felt a year and a half into my graduate studies, and literally half an hour before I got the result that became my PhD thesis and that got me a teaching position at MIT and to some extent at Stanford. So if you find yourself up against the wall, just take a deep breath and recover and remember that I felt that way and here I am today as, the, uh, uh, as a Turing Award winner. And also, I've been saying thank you to all of your faculty here, because without a new generation coming up, who would know of these algorithms? So thank you. OK, with that, the goals of the talk are to pull back the veil on the development of public cryptography. Was it 
we tend to think of it as revolutionary, and I love that people call it that, and uh, that makes me a superstar at places like this. So don't stop. <laughs> but there's also an evolutionary aspect, and in fact, by the end of the talk, you may find yourself wondering, what took them so long? It's almost like there were road signs saying, go here, go here, go here, but we, it, we stumbled around, and uh, many people never even followed the road signs, and so, that's the other thing. Don't be afraid of doing things that seem foolish. There's a section, it may be in the CACM paper, but it's certainly in the book uh, on the wisdom of foolishness. So, let's see. Was it revolutionary or evolutionary? Well, in one sense, it was revolutionary, and if you go back to 1883, when Auguste Kirchhoff enunciated principles for a good cryptographic system, one of them was that all of the security should reside in the secrecy of the key. Now this was very important, I won't go into the details, but if you're going to have all the security residing in the secrecy of the key, a public key cryptographic system sounds like an oxymoron. You can't have it. Of course, what we did was to separate the key into two pieces, a secret part where the security resided and a public part that let you do things you didn't think you might be able to do. Um, let's see. How was it evolutionary? Well, half of the concept there are many ways, but I'll just I'll give you a few here. This is the first one. Half of the concept of public key cryptography, the privacy side, not the digital signature side, not the uh, authentication side, but the privacy side, occurred to three groups independently about the same time. Kind of like Newton and Leibniz coming up with uh, calculus around the same time independently. There seems to be something like that going on. It's in the air. And so you all know about Wit and me at Stanford. Fewer people know about Ralph Merkel at Berkeley, and I'm gonna tell you about him a little bit later, but he's critical. He did this on his own. He was an undergraduate and then a master's student when he came up with these ideas that I'm going to describe to you, and he doesn't get as much credit as he deserves because he published separately from us. And then there were the people at GCHQ, the British Intelligence uh, uh, Organization, who came up with uh, the ideas about the same time, but kept them classified secret. We didn't hear about them until the 90s. And so this is a picture when Time Magazine, which was then, a, it's still a big magazine, but it was huge in the 70s, asked me for a picture uh, for the article they had on public key cryptography. I sent them this picture, and on the left you see Ralph Merkel, uh, in the middle, you see a younger me with more hair and, and, and a beard. <laughs> and you also see Whit Diffie, who looks not that different these days. His hair's a little whiter. <laughs> but the important thing is Ralph deserves equal credit, I believe, for the invention of uh, public key cryptography. Another way that you can see the evolution is through what a cryptographic hierarchy that Wit and I came up with uh, for um, cryptography. One of the first things we did was to try to say, what's the simplest cryptographic entity, what, and how do you get more complex in steps? And the simplest one that we could think of was a one-way function. And we didn't come up with these, they existed. The Unix operating system it was around already in the mid-70s and was using one-way functions for login. They're functions that are easy to compute but hard to go backward and invert. Then we had conventional cryptographic systems. They were a step up, and you'll see why they're a step up on the next slide. And then we had two other levels, trapdoor crypto systems, which I'll tell you about, which you may not have heard of before. They're not public key systems. They're a step below that. And so this is a picture of how to create a one-way function from a conventional cryptographic system. So you can always go, if you have a conventional cryptographic system, you can always create a one-way function, but not necessarily reverse. That's why one-way function is simpler. And in this picture, I use AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, as the conventional cryptographic system. You put some fixed plain text, I call it P0, in the plain text board. It could be all zeros. You put X, the input to the one-way function, in the key port, and you, you encipher P0 under key X to get ciphertext Y. Now, how hard is it to get y from x to compute this function? It's easy because it's encipherment. You don't, encipherment has to be simple. But what about going backward, getting x from y? That's cryptanalysis, so that's hard. So we have a one-way function. Now, while trapdoors are usually associated with public key cryptography, they exist in all cryptographic systems. And actually, as the last line points out, they're related to the p equals np question, uh, a fundamental question in computer science. 
And let me show you how even the simplest cryptographic function, a one-way function, can give you a trap door. I call it a trap door quiz problem. And you've all experienced mild forms of this. You come into class and you take an exam and you slave away for an hour and you have great difficulty getting the result if you get it at all. At the end of the hour, the professor says, uh, turn your papers in. Oh, and we have five minutes remaining. Let me give you the answer and tell you how it proved to you that it's the answer. Why can the professor do in five minutes what you had trouble doing in an hour? Well, there are many different paths that you could use to get the result. The professor had one in mind, so he or she knew which way to go, whereas you had to try all those different things. Now, a trapdoor quiz problem that could take millions of, that we could give you millions of years and you wouldn't solve it, and then I could at the end of the million years come in and say, okay, paper's in, and let me give you the answer and convince you it's right. I would generate a one-way function, maybe the one on the previous slide. I would uh, generate a random input x, but not tell it to you. I would only tell you the output y. So I've given you a description of the one-way function, I've given you the output, and I ask you to find the input. You could work for a million years and not get the answer, but I could quickly convince you of it at the end in, in a matter of milliseconds on a computer. So what is a trapdoor crypto system? I've emphasized this is not a public key crypto system, although people sometimes use the terms interchangeably. This is a concept that Witt and I came up with at Stanford, and in it, it's a conventional cryptographic system. We did not yet have the idea of a public key uh, cryptographic system. But we realized that when one army is using a cryptographic system, they worry about it being captured by the other side. So they want security while they're using it, but they don't want it to be secure if it's used by their adversary. So the ideal tr uh, crypto system for military use, or for that matter, from the point of view of a national intelligence organization, would be a trapdoor crypto system where there's secret information that was used in the design of the system that allows the designer to quickly break it, but no one else can break it, even though they know the trapdoor's there. Now, I should emphasize, we'd never come up with a really good trapdoor crypto system, but we had this concept before we had the concept of public key cryptography. If you can generate a trapdoor crypto system at will, you can generate public key exchange. And let me explain. So I'll pick somebody that fell in the checkered shirt there. We have not talked before, have we? No prearrangement, nope. And so what we'll do is I'm going to tell the whole audience, I wanna just tell you, but I have to tell the whole audience, this trapdoor crypto system, and I know the secret information, but no one else, including you, knows it. When you get the description of the trapdoor crypto system, what you do is generate a random key, encipher a message, and send it to me. Can I break it? Yes, because I have the trapdoor information. Can anyone else break it? No, you've got privacy. You've got basically the privacy part of public key cryptography. So that's an evolutionary aspect of uh, public key cryptography when you start to see how our thinking was going. You start to see what I mean about all these arrows were pointing us in a certain direction. Now, Witt and I developed the concept of a public key crypto system at Stanford Ralph Merkel, independently and initially as an undergraduate, I think he was in his senior year, and then as a master's student at Berkeley, developed the concept of a public key distribution system, which is different. And he had a proof of concept. It wasn't very usable, but it was a, uh, theoretically of interest. And the interesting part is that we, what we now typically call Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange is a Merkel public key distribution system, which is why I have tried to get people to call it Diffie-Hellman-Merkel Key Exchange. Not very successfully. What this slide shows, and let the students in the audience pay particular attention. Now, you should always listen to your professors most of the time. This is, uh, Ralph was taking CS244. That's what that says up at the top left, CS244. In the fall of 1974, he wrote that in by hand because it, it was not on the typewritten material. And in it, he proposes two projects because you had to do a um, project in this class. The first project was to um, basically develop the privacy part of public key cryptography, secure communication over an insecure channel without prearrangement. The second project, I even forget what it was, uh, was much more mundane. What did the professor write? You can read the blue ink, I think, at the top. Project two looks more reasonable, maybe because your description of project one, the really good project, is terribly muddled. Talk to me about this. 
So what did Ralph do? He didn't talk to the professor. He dropped the course and he went off and did his work anyway. Now, the CA, every, every, every journal is going to make some mistakes. And in this case, a CACM editor made a terrible mistake by rejecting Ralph's paper. Ralph's paper appeared after hours. And in fact, I think it appeared just about the time of the RSA paper. And so people tend to think that Ralph's, Ralph's work followed on ours. But we've, I've made it very clear that Ralph's work actually preceded ours by a bit. We didn't know about it, but he actually developed it before us. The editor wrote, and Ralph has the whole letter on his website, Merkel.com, I think it is. I was particularly bothered by the fact that there are no references to the literature. Has anyone else ever investigated this approach? What's the answer? No. no. That's why this paper was so important. Now, in the defense of the CACM, when RS, the RSA paper was submitted, I was one of the uh, reviewers, and I got a very unusual letter from the editor. It said, this may be the most important paper we ever published. Please expedite your review. You don't usually get letters like that from editors. And so RSA and the Diffie-Hellman paper got expedited uh, publication, which is why they appeared so much earlier uh, than they, they normally would have. But Ralph's was delayed. In fact, what the one reviewer that the editor got who she described as an experienced cryptography expert wrote, the paper is not in the mainstream of present crypto crypto cryptography thinking. I would not recommend that it be published. So don't get discouraged. I mean, it's good to listen to people, but if you really have this gut feel that you're on the right course, stick with it. So I've also, I'd also like to um, give credit to some of the unsung heroes or the undersung heroes of public key cryptography. And John Gill is number two. So who's number one? Ralph Merkel. I mean, he's not unsung, but he's undersung. <laughs> so John Gill, so I came on the faculty at Stanford. I'd done my graduate work there, 66 to 68, and went away for a few years. And then I came back in 71. And John Gill came, if I remember, in 1972. And so I thought of him as the new guy, you know, the new kid on the block. Uh, and he had done his PhD at Berkeley under Manuel Blum, who many of you know. Uh, and John had, even though Manuel's in computer science, John's PhD was in mathematics. And so John was a much better mathematician than me. And so I went to him for advice. They said, John, I'm looking for one-way functions. And why did I start there? Because that's the simplest entity. And do you have any suggestions? Well, very early on, he said, what about factoring? You know, it's easy to multiply, find two large primes, multiply them together, but it's hard to factor. And we said, yeah, we've already thought of that. Of course, we missed the RSA system. Um, but I said, anything else? And he said, well, what about indices? And I'm an electrical engineer by training, so I said, what's an index? He said, what's, well, it's what we today call a discrete logarithm, okay? And the, the index problem, the discrete logarithm problem looked like a good one-way function because it's easy to compute y equals alpha to the x mod q even if q is 1,000 or 2,000 bits long. Why? Because even though you might have to raise alpha to the 2 to the 1,000th power, it doesn't take 2 to the 1,000th multiplications. It only takes 1,000 squaring operations. Each squaring operation is a multiplication, and you're always reducing mod Q, so the numbers don't get too big. And what if you don't want alpha to the 16th or alpha to, to the 2 to the 100th? What if you want alpha to the 9th power? Well, no problem. You just multiply alpha to the 8th that you got in this successive squarings by alpha to the 1st. The net result is you can do exponentiation in at most 2b multiplications if b is the number of bits in q. So exponentiation is easy, but the inverse operation going backward, uh, the index or discrete log problem uh, was believed to be and is still believed to be much slower. But we've made a lot of progress. When uh, John suggested this, the best we knew was exponential in the size of the modulus, whereas now it's sub-exponential. Well, we played with the um, discrete exponential function for some time. Let me just see how I'm doing. Yeah, I'm doing okay. Uh, we played with the discrete exponential function for some time, and then one night I wrote down something very similar to what you see here. I don't have the handwritten notes, but I reproduced the basic idea. I said, if you know alpha and you know x, computing y, which is exponentiation, is easy. I just described that. If you know alpha and y going back to x is hard, that's the discrete logarithm problem. 
And the third possibility is if you know X and Y, getting alpha also turns out to be easy, and I won't go into why that is. I then wrote down, if you have a, I was looking for a conventional cryptographic system. In fact, I don't think we had the public key concept yet. And I was trying to find a structured conventional cryptographic system. If you know the plain text and the key, computing the ciphertext is easy because that's enciphering. If you know the ciphertext and the key, computing the plain text, that's deciphering, that's also easy. But if you know the plain text and the ciphertext, computing the key, has to be hard because that's cryptanalysis. So in the first three, we have two easies and a hard, and in the second three, we have two easies and a hard. So what's the obvious thing to think of doing? Saying the two hard things have to be the same. So that would say that X and K have to be the same because those are the outputs of the two hard operations. The bottom line is I then played with it a bit more and came up with the equation shown here which are now known as the pollig hellman crypto system because it appeared in a paper that I published with Steve Pollan. And that's a picture of Steve around this time. Um, somewhat uh, tragically, Steve died last April, uh, and uh, so also I'd like to dedicate this to, to Steve's memory and uh, wonderful man. The, in this conventional cryptographic system, the ciphertext is the plain text to the kth power mod Q. That's an exponentiation, it's easy. Deciphering, you raise the ciphertext to the dth power mod q. Now, if you substitute that first equation into the second, what you see is that when you raise c to the d, you get p to the kd power, right? And so you want, if that's going to be the plain text, you want kd to be the same as 1. Well, for reasons I won't go into, arithmetic in the exponent is not done modulo q, it's done modulo q minus 1. But that doesn't mess things up. You can still find the deciphering exponent very easily from the enciphering exponent, so long as you know Q, but that's public information. Now, those of you who know the RSA system may look at this and say, wait a minute, that looks just like RSA. And it is. It is RSA with two differences. The RSA, RSA public key crypto system is done mod N instead of mod Q, where N is the product of two primes. And instead of calling the enciphering exponent k for secret key, they called it e. And instead of doing computing the deciphering exponent mod q minus 1, you compute it mod p minus 1 times q minus 1. And that's how you get a public key crypto system, because you have to know the factorization of n to compute the deciphering exponent, which is secret, from the public enciphering exponent. Now, Steve and I totally missed this, so RSA deserved the credit for the RSA, but I have to, can't tell you how many times I've kicked myself for missing that. <laughs> so this is a picture of the famous trio, R, S, and A. Uh, and so let's see, Ron is in the middle, and uh, Adi Shamir is on the left, and Len Adelman is on the right. That was taken about the time uh, that they, if maybe a year after they came up with the algorithm. So let me describe to you now Diffie-Hellman-Merkel, which is usually just called Diffie-Hellman, so that's, if that's what you, you know it by, that, that's what this is, uh, key exchange, public key distribution system. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was, again, playing with this discrete exponential function. You can see why I call John Gill unsung hero number two. So many things float out of this discrete exponential, even in a way RSA. I mean, the RSA involves exponentiation. So I was saying, okay, let's, we're going to have a bunch of users. I want each user to have a secret key and a public key. And um, let's call, um, um, let's make alpha and q public because there are actually five variables here, y, x, alpha, and q, four variables. Uh, and so I said, let's make alpha and q um, uh, public. And in that case, if there's going to be a public key, it would have to be y, and the secret key would have to be x, because it's hard to compute the secret key from the public key, but not the other way around. And then what I came up with, and I'll show you the derivation on another slide, is that the key that two users want to share so if you, everybody, all of us have pairs like this. Every, each one of us generates a random X, computes Y, and puts it in a public directory. And then when I want to talk with the fellow in the checkered shirt, what do I do? I look up his public Y, raise it to my secret X. What does he do? The mirror image. He takes my public Y and raises it to his secret X. 
it doesn't matter whether you first raise alpha to the x1 power and then to the x2 power, or raise it to the x2 power and then the x1 power, you still get alpha to the x1, x2. So we get a common key out of this. And that is the key that two users would use Kij. Now the interesting thing is I was trying to find a public key crypto system, one that also did digital signatures. This doesn't do signatures, although Tahir El Gamal, uh, who came up with the El Gamal signature system, a PhD student of mine, figured out how to get a signature out of this. And in fact, it's the basis of the, uh, one of the, in fact, the first um, American national standard for digital signatures, the digital signature algorithm. But I was trying to find a public key crypto system when I came up with a public key distribution system. Whose idea was public key distribution? Ralph Merkel. So you see why I tend to call it a Diffie-Hellman-Merkel key exchange. Of course, we didn't put names on it. We called it alpha to the x1, x2. So here's the way I came up with that. It was late one night, it was probably after midnight in my study at home. I was playing with this one-way function that had proved so useful. And I said, let's let alpha and q be public. Now by the way, that's critical. There are many permutations here, many variations. And the fact that I finally tried that was one reason that it took us so long. Then computing y from x is easy because that's exponentiation. Computing x from y is hard. That's the index or discrete log problem. So let's try letting x, be, x of i be user i's secret key and y of i be his or her public key. And let's see. Then what? Eventually, I tried the equation shown there. I tried raising, I mean, I tried multiplying them together. All those things didn't do any good. But when I exponentiated, I raised the other user's public key to my secret power, and he did the mirror image. Lo and behold, out came this public key distribution system. So who's unsung hero number four? Let's see. Can I blame it? Uh, that is Richard Tropel. Uh, Rich came up with a factoring algorithm, a sieving method, which uh, is very similar to the quadratic sieve. And Carl Pomerantz, whose work is better known, because Carl publishes in typical places, Richard did not publish, but he did circulate his work. And if you read Knuth, you'll find references to Schropel's unpublished work very early on, and he sent it to me. When Ron Rivest sent me the first draft of their M MIT report on their algorithm, they were proposing using 256-bit keys, and I said, you probably should increase that because Rich thinks he can factor 256-bit numbers, and in fact, the quadratic sieve does do that. Um, Pomerantz, in a paper, I think it's called A Tale of Two Sieves, credits Schropel's unpublished work as the inspiration, that's his exact word for the quadratic sieve. Another unsung hero, and the last I'll treat today, is uh, Lauren Kahnfelder. He, did, he was doing a bachelor's thesis at MIT. So again, those of you who are undergraduates, don't despair. You can actually do really good work, really good research. Uh, this was under Len Adelman's uh, direction. And in 1978, Lauren proposed what are now called digital certificates. And the basis of uh, the, a, a huge industry, uh, including VeriSign and other certificate authorities. Uh, I, don't, I hadn't known what happened to Lauren, so I actually looked him up and I made connections a couple of weeks ago. He's retired, living on Hawaii, and uh, still very interested in things. Let me shift gears at this point um, to the political side of the, uh, the, uh, the work that I did. I just thought I was doing mathematics, computer science, electrical engineering, but the government in the United States and probably elsewhere had a very different view of this. Uh, and let me start off by telling you, in March 1975, something called the Data Encryption Standard, the predecessor to the Advanced Encryption Standard we use today, was announced by the federal government. Uh, Witt and I looked at it, and we quickly realized that the key size was inadequate. At best, it was marginal and would be in totally insecure within five or ten years as computation got cheaper. It had a 56-bit key. Now, that means there are two to the 56 keys, which to an order of magnitude is 10 to the 17th, 100,000 million million keys. And especially in 1975, the idea of searching that many keys seemed impossible, but it isn't. We estimated that you could build a special purpose chip 
and this was a back of the envelope calculation initially, that would search a million keys per second. We also estimated you could buy a million of these chips because at $10 each, that would be $10 million. So now, and then you, you need a few other things like printed circuit boards, power supplies. But how long does it take you to search 10 to the 17th keys if you're searching a million keys a second and you have a million chips? Only 10 to the fifth seconds, which is about a day. A day is a little over 80,000 seconds. And we then estimated that the cost of this exhaustive search was about $10,000 per solution. And worse, it was decreasing because of Moore's law by an order of magnitude every five years. So even if we were being very optimistic and were off by a factor of 10, th that would be erased within five years' time. Even worse, what if there were shortcuts to exhaustive search? This is the simplest approach, of course. Well, was it a technical or a political problem is the first question. I thought it was technical. I was very naive at first. And I wrote letters to the government. It was then called the National Bureau of Standards. Now it's the National Institute of Standards and Technology, saying, hey, you guys should increase the key size. And they didn't really pay much attention. After about six months, I realized that I had a political problem. In fact, I was told this by uh, someone on a, uh, an IEEE computer standards committee. He said, you have a political problem, not a technical problem. Our helping you is not going to get any further than, than you have. If you want to change this, you have to go to Congress, get hearings. You have to go to the press, get coverage. And so my intellect told me that was the right thing to do. But in January 1976, two high-level NSA employees came out to California and paid Witt and me a visit. And they were very nice. I mean, they were trying to win us over. Uh, um, and, but they told us that continuing to talk the way we were talking would go, was going to cause grave harm to national security. So now I've got a problem. My intellect has told me I should go public with this. NSA is telling me now directly that uh, this is going to cause grave harm to national security. What do I do? Well, in the CACM paper that I, in the December issue, I go into this in a little more detail, and in our book we go into yet a little more detail. I went home that night to figure out the right thing to do. And while I'm trying to figure out the right thing to do, an idea pops into my head. Forget about what's right. You have you'll never have a greater chance to make your mark in the world. Run with this. Go public. Forget about whether it's right or wrong. Now, who would, who, what, someone described, um, uh, PJ was describing me as a good human being, I think, something like that. What good human being would go with that motivation? And I, I wasn't as good a human being then as I am now, and I have to thank my wife <laughs> for a lot of that growth. But, so back then, it's almost like the devil sat on my shoulder. You know, in the movies you've seen where the devil's whispering in one ear and the angel in the other of an actor? So the devil's whispering in this ear telling me, run with it. And I thought that I made a rational decision that going public was the right thing. But there's a story that I don't have time to go into that is, I don't think it's in the CACM pa paper because there was a word limit there, but it's in the book. Just search on uh, devil on my shoulder uh, um, and you'll find it. Um, I realized five years later that I had fooled myself, that I thought I'd brush the devil off my shoulder, but I had done what most people do, most human beings, we are fallible, when confronted with that kind of uh, dilemma. They figure out what they want to do and then come up with the reasons for doing it, whether it's right or wrong. Now, I came to this realization watching a movie about the making of the first atom bomb. And I think that the people who worked on that fooled themselves, and I explain why in the book. Uh, I vowed I would never do that again. And there's another story that I don't have time for um, that's also certainly in the book and possibly in the CACM paper, where five years later, after I'd made this vow never to fool myself again, because I could have blown up the world instead of, it was actually the right thing to do, by the way. Uh, Admiral Inman, who was director of NSA at the time, uh, was interviewed several years ago for an article and was asked whether he would still try to um, uh, suppress my work. And he said quite the opposite. With what I now know, we would try to get it out as quickly as possible. It was in the interest of national security to get it out because um, foreign uh, adversaries were spying on American companies, stealing importance, uh, important secrets that had national security implications. But uh, at the time, 
I, while I made the right decision, I made it for the wrong reasons. And so there's the second story where five years after I've made my vow, I'm confronted with a similar problem in the patent fight with RSA. RS, Rivest and I were good friends, and then we became adversaries during this patent fight, and we're good friends again. Uh, but th at this time, um, there's a story where I was so angry at RSA, uh, they sold their company for $250 million, and we made almost nothing off our patents. That was the basis of it. Um, um, that I was tempted to go with something. It, it looked like it made good business sense, but I didn't want to go if I was doing it for revenge. And the good news is now I don't even want revenge. I, I like Ron, Adi, and Len. We have a good relationship, and it's much better having friends than enemies. Yes, it, it is in the CA stand paper. I'll skip that. Uh, then, in, I'll skip this. Uh, basically, there's a story, which I know is in the book, possibly in the CACM article, where a man who's a member of the IEEE writes to the IEEE in July 1977 saying he's concerned that the institute, is, as a member, he's concerned that they're breaking the law by publishing my papers. He doesn't use those words. He talks in code, but the IEEE understands, and they respond in code, but they let me know. And what the code is is, in, is described there. Um, but the bottom line was, I went to Stanford's general counsel, their top attorney, and he recommended, among other things, that instead of my giving two papers that were slated for an international symposium on information theory the coming October at Cornell University, that the, um, uh, instead of the students giving the papers as I had intended, I should give them instead because there might be a court case that would go on years, which fortunately there was not, and a new PhD would have trouble getting a job with that kind of uh, uh, issue hanging over his head. And uh, fortunately, um, nothing like that happened. And I'll skip a bit more. So how did we resolve this conflict? Um, it started, for, interestingly, and this is nice, I give credit to someone else. It wasn't me. It was Admiral Bobby Inman, the director of NSA. In 1978, and I believe it was the spring, I don't have notes from this, but it was early in 78, I get a call from his office that the, uh, the director, Admiral Inman, is going to be in California and he'd like to meet with me. What, was I interested? Well, we had not been talking directly since 1976. We were fighting it out in the press. I jumped at the opportunity and said, of course. So a few weeks later, he shows up in my office and the first words out of his mouth, it's nice to see you don't have horns. And this is how I was being described within the agency. And of course, so what did I do? I looked back at him and said, same here, because I had picked, I mean, we were demonizing each other. And I think you can start to see how this works and how it relates to uh, relationships. When my wife, my wife and I have been married over 50 years now, but 10, and we were madly in love when we met, but 10 years into the marriage, we were demonizing each other, which is something, unfortunately, that married couples often do. Good news is we stopped doing that, and not only did we stop, uh, did we save the marriage, but we uh, are back very much in love as we were when we met almost 52 years ago. And you can see how this applies internationally. The United States demonized the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union demonized the United States. And you can see it going on in countries all over the world. We need to stop that. And so one of the things I've argued is we need to start looking for the mistakes we're making rather than the mistakes that our adversaries are making because we have no control over their behavior, but we do have control over our own. So then Inman told me, I'm meeting with you against the advice of all the other senior personnel at NSA. But he then added, I don't see the harm in talking. He did something that in the book my wife and I wrote we call getting curious instead of furious. And that's really important. So when someone says something that makes you really mad, calm down, you know, maybe leave the room for a little bit, and then ask some more questions. And there, there's a story where my wife was looking at new cars three, four years ago when it made no sense to me. It seemed crazy. But instead of treating her like she was crazy, which would have driven her crazy, reinforcing my belief, I went to her and I said, it makes no sense to me. It feels crazy, but I know you're not crazy. What am I missing? And she then gave me an explanation that made what seemed crazy into a brilliant idea. 
So this is a case, you can see it in, in cryptography, you can see it in per other personal relationships, you can see it internationally. And as an example of the value of uh, this relationship, it was a cautious relationship at first, but Admiral Inman and I are now friends. And as an example of that, about 10 years ago, I was trying to apply a risk analysis framework to um, the question of nuclear deterrence. How risky is it to threaten to destroy the world in an effort to keep the peace? Turns out it's a lot riskier than most people think. Uh, and I um, was trying to get support from people with national security credentials, and I asked Admiral Inman if he would sign a statement of support, and within 24 hours he said he would. Now, he had to agree with what the statement said, but if he didn't trust me, he wouldn't have signed it. So the conclusion of all this is it's better to have friends than enemies. Now, we all say we know that, right? But how many of us, when we're in a fight, like with it, I was with NSA or NSA with me, how many of us do what Admiral Inman did, which is to start asking questions and say, I don't see the harm in talking, and even more importantly, I don't see the harm in listening, which is really critical. Uh, resolution grew. There was a, in 1993, Congress requested a study from the National Research Council, which is the American research arm of our national academies, National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And um, we had committee members. I was representing privacy interests. Uh, we had a former FBI, I'm sorry, a former attorney general. So he represented the interests of law enforcement and the FBI. We had a former deputy director of NSA, and by putting aside our initial prejudices, by talking and even more importantly listening to one another, we reached unanimous conclusions, which have had a very important impact, I believe, on uh, what we can do in industry. In particular, when the committee was formed, it was very difficult to export even DES, and we recommended that these re uh, export restrictions be considerably relaxed. Relaxed, And remember, this is unanimous conclusions, including a former attorney general. We also concluded that the classified briefings we got were largely irrelevant. So when someone tells you, if you knew what I knew, you'd think differently, we heard that in the unclassified briefings, but we concluded it didn't apply here. We also concluded that key escrow, which it, the government was recommending at the time, was not well defined, and so we stopped trying to figure out how to make sense of it, and we recommended the government experiment with key escrow. It's now called exceptional access, which is a little more general, for its own purposes, and if it could figure out the problems that we saw, including international ones. Who escrows the key when there's an international communication? Oh, the United States will do that. How do you think the Indi Indian government feels about that? Not very good. So, and we said, we, if they find a solution, come back to us and we'll consider it, but they never did. The current fight between the FBI and Apple and other uh, in, uh, uh, companies seems to me to be very similar to this fight that we had back then, and I think there's a lesson to be learned there. Now, this talk has been about the evolution of public key cryptography, but I think you've also seen how it's the, a talk about the evolution of me, how I went, I'm not the same person today that I was, who I was 40 years ago fighting NSA 42 years ago. And as I said, uh, the credit for that has to go not, I mean, I get some of the credit, my wife will tell you that, but if it hadn't been for her pushing me, I wouldn't have done it. And uh, she's also a much, she would be the first to say that she had to change as well. And so let me see. The way this relates to uh, cyber is if cyber weapons continue to evolve, they could pose an existential threat to civilization. And so we better start thinking about what we're gonna do about this. We don't like the Russians meddling in American elections. There's no talk about America meddling in other nations' elections. All countries that have the capability do things like this. And we need to start thinking about how we're gonna create a world where that doesn't happen. And so I'll conclude with two thoughts. It's better to have friends than enemies, and really take that to heart. Don't just say it as a throwaway phrase. Think every time you're in a conflict, am I doing that? Can I turn this enemy into a friend? And get curious, not furious. Thank you.
have time for uh, a few questions. Uh, people, I mean, the, this, this opportunity is for students to ask questions also. So get ready there. We'll start with uh, Srinivas in the front row. Sir, the com quantum computing is real. Today we have computers uh, emerging with quantum capability. And uh, what do you see will be the you know, next Turing Award winning prize in this era of quantum computing for the crypto domain? Well, the first thing I'd say is that the next Turing Award or the Turing Award 10 years from now, which is harder to predict, is probably going to be in an area that you never would have even thought of, just as um, 10 years before we did our work in cryptography, no one would have thought that there was much to do there. In fact, I'll tell you that um, my advisor at Stanford, later a colleague, Tom Cover, a uh, great information theorist, I saw him maybe five years before we had these really good results, and he had developed a wonderful theory for broadcast channels. It was multi-user information theory. And I told him, I said, I'm hoping I can develop um, a theory of cryptography that might do for cryptography what you did for uh, broad for multi-user information theory. And Tom was usually very supportive, but in this case, even Tom looked at me with a face that kind of said, huh? <laughs> How are you going to do that? So I, I don't think we'll know. As to quantum uh, cryptography or quantum computing? Yes, quantum computing, I think. Um, there are people in the audience who know that better than I. The, the, ge the, uh, the general uh, feeling I have from ta having talked to such people is that Quantum computing that could really break 2,000-bit RSA or 2,000-bit Diffie-Hellman-Merkel is certainly not on the horizon. In fact, we won't even know if it's on the horizon for a number of years. And once we know that it might be, we'll have about 10 years to plan. But I have argued that we should be planning not only for post-quantum cryptography, which people are doing, but if you look at advances in factoring and discrete logarithms, which seem to go hand in hand, we got a tremendous advance in 1970. This was Morris and Brillhart's uh, uh, continued fraction factoring algorithm. Another major advance around 1980, Schroepel's sieving method, or Pomerantz's quadratic sieve. Another am amazing advance around 1990, 10 years later, the number field sieve. In the intervening 28 years, let's call it 30 to round it off, we have not seen a major advance in factoring. And so this has led some people to say, don't worry, it looks like factoring and discrete logs have hit a brick wall. But going, looking at the way I've analyzed risk analysis for nuclear deterrence, people say that we haven't had a nuclear war, we haven't had a world war in almost 73 years. Don't mess with success. Well, if you tossed a coin 73 times and got tails every time, but you knew nothing else about the coin, would you be confident? Would you bet your life on it showing, not showing ahead in the next 100 tosses? Absolutely not. In the same way, I then applied this to uh, these advances in factoring. If you think of heads as a major advance in factoring and tails as not in a 10-year period, we've seen heads, 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 tails, tails, probably tails. Even if the next two years don't have a major advance, having seen heads, 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 tails, 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 would you bet that there isn't going to be another advance? And another advance would really kill uh, Diffie-Hellman-Merkel and RSA. And so we should be thinking about ways not just for quantum computing, but because of potential advances in factoring. A question back there, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, doctor. Uh, I just want to ask you uh, your views on the civilian privacy thing where the governments are now trying to intrude into the, the civilian things. And also, mm -hmm. how do you see it going into that area? To how much extent do you see government intruding into our lives? And the second thing uh, I want to ask... Uh, well, actually, stop there. I, yeah. I'll have trouble doing that much. Yeah. Okay? I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. I'm, uh, 72, I'm, 72, I'm, I'm 72 years old. My memory's not that good. Um, so first of all, I've already touched on your first question, which is the uh, conflict between public privacy, preventing un uh, unauthorized government intrusion, or uh, other you know, criminals intruding on your lives. Uh, I think that uh, uh, adding exceptional access mechanisms, and it's not just me, Ron Revest and about 15 experts in computer security had a uh, report called Keys Under Doormats that you can find on the uh, web very easily, in which they said adding a exceptional access mechanisms is almost sure to weaken 
the security, and often in ways we can't even envision, so they recommend it against it. The other thing I'd point out is while law enforcement often says they want to go back to the good old days, the 1950s, when they got a court order, they could go to the wires from your home to the central office and put a tap and listen to what you're saying, whereas they can't do that if your uh, communication is encrypted today. I don't think they want to go back to the good old days. They were the bad old days from law enforcement's point of view. They didn't have cell phones. I mean, I walk around with this device, and if, I, if, if the government wants to know where I am, all they have to do is get a court order and go to the uh, cell towers, and they can track where I've been, and we tend not to turn them off. Um, there are private surveillance cameras all over the place. And so when there's a crime committed, law enforcement can go to the various uh, businesses and say, would you give us the tapes? And they almost always say yes. Um, license plate readers have been automated so they can track where cars are. So they're probably getting, law enforcement is probably getting two to three orders of magnitude at least more information than they did in the supposed good old days. A lot of it's encrypted and they're stymied and I sympathize because when they're, when they're going after criminals and terrorists, I would love them to catch them. But I think that right now the trade-off is in favor of not having these exceptional access mechanisms. Question, Dave. Hello. Uh, do you personally like the idea of the crypto systems, uh, cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency. I don't own any cryptocurrency, so I think it's not that I don't like it or not like it. It's I don't trust it enough, especially with what I've read. But uh, people like Mark Andreessen, who uh, uh, are very clever uh, venture capitalists, uh, have invested in it, so don't take my word for it. <laughs> Any comment which can help the futuristic asset of the cryptocurrency? Sorry again? Any comment for the future of the cryptocurrency? No. Will it go up or down? No, no comment. Months and all. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it'll go up and it'll go down. <laughs> so we have time for one or two more questions. I especially encourage the backside students to ask questions. Yeah, first of all, hello, Professor. Uh, I uh, want to thank you because uh, you gave me two semesters of nightmares when I was in my undergraduation studying public key uh. cryptography as a subject. So thank you for that. And it inspired me and today I work for Microsoft Research. So thank you. My question to you is there has been a lot of speculation when it comes to the merging of AI with public key cryptography or the repercussions of AI on security as a whole. Uh, we have seen Elon Musk, we have seen Bill Gates, Sundar Pichai talking about this. So what are, are your, your views when it comes to artificial intelligence as a proponent for, uh, I mean, cryptography or as an adversary for cryptography in the years to come? Well, that's an easy question for me to answer. I know absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> very bad, very bad. And I'm serious. Oh, we're doing one more? Okay, uh, you get to applaud for me twice, question. which I yeah. love. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, thank you for this session. Uh, I would like to ask you a question about blockchain, sir. Uh, sir, since uh, blockchain is a system in which the uh, data complexity increases with time, how far do you see it going, sir? Because every time the data increases, the computational requirement increases, and that way we are using up energy and harming the environment. So do you see it as do you see it as a system that can survive in the long run? I also have to say I don't know to that either. I am concerned about the uh, this huge amount of energy that's going into this uh, uh, data mining, uh, um, but I really don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I sh there's something I was going to say at the beginning that I'll tell you now. Why is my talk so historical? Why aren't I talking about the current state of affairs? Because I don't know them, because. <laughs> I won this award for work I did over 40 years ago. And about 35 years ago, I started shifting to from information security to international security, avoiding needless wars to avoid needless nuclear threats. And so I don't know anywhere near as much about this as I, sh as I should. And I appreciate your applauding me in spite of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, hope, I, I hope you all got uh, why I you know, said he's a great scientist, but a greater human being, and some of it came through. Uh, I was thinking about it. There is a public secret that we can all take comfort in. You were born on the same day as Mahatma Gandhi. So, so we are not surprised. But different years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
Dear computing brothers and sisters, um, indeed it is a privilege to introduce the next speaker. Uh, I am Aarti Dikshit, Chair ACMW India. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Sunita Saravgi, a professor at IIT Bombay, Computer Science and Engineering Department. She has been an alumni of IIT Kharagpur and uh, University of California, Berkeley. In her path of search of knowledge, her guru, that is her PhD advisor, was Michael Stonebreaker, uh, another Turing Award winner. She has been involved uh, at multiple places. She has been involved in as a researcher with Google Research, with IBM Almaden Research Center, and uh, she has been visiting faculty at CMU. In fact, it's a known, known thing to us that she is uh, well published. She has authored numerous publications in reputed journals and conferences and has many patents in her kitty. Uh, she has been member of various research and award committees and her research interests include database, data mining, machine learning, statistics, wherein currently she's working in the area of deep learning web information extraction, data integration, graphical models, and structured learning. In fact, she is truly a role model. Let me share one incident from yesterday. I happened to meet uh, an innocent undergraduate student. She came and she was jumping and she told me, you know, ma'am, tomorrow I'm going to again get a chance to listen to Sunita, ma'am. So I think that is all tells about her. So please welcome Professor Sunita. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a topic from uh, deep learning. So this is the decade, we are in this decade of deep learning and anything I can say to express the excitement around deep learning will only be an understatement. Uh, but uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about one subset of topics which relate to the prediction of sequences. So uh, most of the excitement around deep learning involved classification tasks, but uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one part of it which involves sequence prediction. So first let us uh, kind of define what I would be focusing on in this talk. So this is the task we are interested in. So we are given say an input X and uh, this input X can be any complex uh, entity, like for example, a sentence in la natural language, an image, or say an audio wave. And the prediction task that we are interested in is to predict a sequence Y of discrete tokens, and let's call these tokens Y1, Y2, through Yn. So an example of such a sequence of discrete tokens would be say another sentence which you can think of as a sequence of words. And typically each token, so each yi here comes from a huge vocabulary, say the words in uh, your target, say suppose if you're trying to generate a sentence in English, it would be the size of the English dictionary. And uh, 
Now the problem, this, uh, the, the reason this problem is more interesting than simple classification is because the tokens are interdependent. You cannot assume that you can just, you cannot just solve n different classification tasks to generate sentences because sentences need to have a structure and that makes the tokens independent of each other. So, so this is our task, okay? This is a very simply specified task. But turns out it has lots of applications in many different domains, including uh, speech recognition, uh, translation, um, image uh, understanding. So there are several examples. We are going to see them shortly. And before deep learning, uh, each of those tasks, translation or speech recognition, these were sort of solved in specific communities. So there was this community of uh, natural language processing researchers, community of speech researchers, and they worked in their own silos and they developed their domain specific op operation, their domain specific methods, which gave them accuracy up to a certain level. And then came deep learning and totally changed the game. So there was this one sort of kind of uh, one paradigm, one way of thinking, which kind of broke all records of uh, accuracies that each of those communities were getting in their own silos. And in this talk, I am going to go over what, ex how exactly that happened. And, uh, but before that, let me just quickly describe the different applications that I just mentioned. So let's look at translation. So uh, in translation, the, uh, you are given a sentence in one language. Say here, I, on this slide, I have put an example of a translation from English to Hindi. So, uh, so here, the input X, which is the context which we feed into a network, is the sentence in English. And we are interested in predicting Y, which are the sequence of words which would form a, 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 a sentence in Hindi. So before deep learning, there has been, you know, a veritable community of researchers working on translation. And uh, the, the, the primary technique that they used involved first creating elaborate transfer grammar rules. And then uh, on the side also having this huge phrase translation tables, which will say how a phrase in one language translates to another. Think of it as glorified dictionary. And then there would be a little bit of statistical learning on top of it to kind of take a sentence in a source language and translate into a target language. Now with deep learning, you will see generic solutions which do not require any of these domain expertise, which actually bet, you know, beat hollow the benchmarks on these conventional methods. Uh, the next example uh, is uh, where there is a lot of excitement of uh, the success obtained by deep learning is from image captioning. So in this case, the input context X, say, is an image. And uh, uh, normally people are interested uh, when they talk about uh, sort of using uh, machine learning or data mining, they think of as the object classification task where you are interested in identifying the objects which are present in an image. So you just want to identify that there is a motorcycle or a person in this image. But uh, in this particular talk, we are interested in generating a well-formed caption for this uh, image. So we want to take an input image like this and generate a caption for the image. So an example caption here would be a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. I mean, clearly this is much more uh, fun and informative and perhaps even more useful than just identifying the objects in the image. Again, uh, before deep learning, uh, so the people working in image processing uh, used to solve this problem in bit of a uh, kind of, a, you know, by patching together many uh, intermediate steps. So one way was to, uh, suppose if I were given an image like this, first I would try to find other images which are possibly similar to my input image. And perhaps for those images, if I have a caption, then I will try to kind of, uh, you know, maybe edit that caption a bit to generate a caption for a new image. So mostly they were based on kind of making only, taking only local variations of an already existing caption, or they would fill templates, okay? Whereas with 
deep learning now, the, uh, there is actually very promising results of generating such captions automatically uh, on a, in the wild, you know, without requiring you to follow only, you know, a particular templatized way of generating captions. Uh, a third example, this is the problem that I worked on when I was doing a sabbatical at Google last year back, was to use um, deep learning for conversation assistance. Say here, the context, so, so this, this product in which I was working was this smart messaging app of Google called Allo, and they were interested in providing suggested responses so that while you are have, having some quick communication with people on the go, you don't actually have to type in a response. So in this case, the context X would be say, the context of the current conversation and what you are interested in proposing, in predicting is a set of appropriate responses that uh, you can then select from rather than type. So, uh, so, so you already see some examples of it when you when you try to read, say, your mail on inbox. So you can also do the same thing on conversation. Uh, so uh, finally, this is the last of the examples. So uh, you can uh, uh, also think about speech recognition as a sequence prediction task. In this case, your input X is a speech spectrogram, and uh, and that is like a very high dimensional real matrix, you can think of it a long time. And the output is a sequence of phonemes, which when you concatenate, will give you the, the, the speech corresponding to the input audio. So we will see that this is also a sequence prediction task. So now uh, what I'm going to go over in the rest of my talk is to, uh, to go over one of the state of the art models for doing sequence prediction uh, in deep learning. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so the main challenge, so it's not like sequence prediction has not been around before deep learning. You know, I myself have been working on various kinds of statistical sequence, sequence uh, modeling tasks uh, early and in the context of data cleaning. So I would, for example, create a hidden Markov model to, uh, to, mod, to, to kind of uh, create a probability distributions over address tokens and use that to segment addresses or to clean uh, noisy addresses. Uh, CRFs came after hidden Markov models and they you know, provided a big boost in accuracy and saw a lot of applications in various information extraction tasks and, and um, also, uh, you know, NLP tasks like, you know, noun chunking or in, in, or in identifying key phrases. So, uh, so, you know, with all of these things around, the question is, what is it that you got from deep learning models that were not available from earlier generation of models like CRFs and HMLs. So in my mind, the two big breakthroughs, which is why I got interested, my, my interest was not first in deep learning, but rather more in understanding what is it that I get from the state of the art deep learning models, which I did not already have from CRFs. And that is the capability to model long-term dependencies. So most of the earlier statistical uh, approaches like which were based on CRFs and hidden Markov models, they would, they would model, they would, they would make conditional independencies assumptions of the kind that the word that you see at, at the fifth position is independent of the word at the third position given the word at the fourth position. Now, uh, with the, as machine learning researchers started accepting uh, the formulations of non-convex optimization problems, they were happy to break this assumption and, and give to themselves an intractable factorization of the probability distribution. And, uh, and with deep learning, you suddenly were not afraid to model long-term dependency by, by trying to uh, just factorize the probability distribution using straight chain rule and not making any independence assumption and uh, using the power of RNNs as we will see shortly to capture long-term dependencies. And that is very important, for it, particularly when you are modeling natural language. So suppose if we are trying to use a sequence model for conversation assistance, then uh, you know here is, I've put an example of, uh, 
of long-term dependency. So suppose if you want to generate a sentence of the form, how is your son? I heard he was unwell. You want he to depend on the token, which could be more than like a distance one or two away. It could be arbitrarily far away in the conversation context. And you will not be able to do this unless you can capture long-term dependencies. And if you make conditional independencies assumptions that earlier models made, then you will miss out on capturing such consistency requirements. The second thing that was made possible was the capability to handle very open-ended prediction spaces. So earlier, when you try to use, say, a CRF or a hidden Markov model for, um, for named entity recognition, the output sequence of labels had almost a one-to-one -one correspondence with the input sequence of tokens. Whereas here, the application that I mentioned, particularly in conversation, there is no alignment, there is no one-to-one -one alignment between the input and the output. So when you're trying to generate a response, you have to pick a response from a space of possible responses which, are, which can be very diverse, not just in the set of words, but also in the lengths, the number of tokens that you use in generating the response. And that we will see shortly is extremely challenging. So if you want to create a joint probability distribution over sentences which can vary in length all the way from one, from one token to 50 tokens, then, then sort of handling this joint distribution within the finite limits of uh, uh, an optimization problem that you can reasonably solve uh, even in today's deep learning model be models becomes extremely challenging. But, uh, but still, with deep learning, you could even, you can at least think about trying to solve these problems, although not perfectly, and earlier it was absolutely impossible. Okay? So with these, with these two promises, we will see how, how, how are these two problems solved okay, with uh, modern, uh, modern deep learning um, systems. Okay? So uh, I'm going to talk about this um, uh, most commonly used model, which is this encoder-decoder model for sequence prediction. So this is the model which has delivered uh, a recipe for doing sequence prediction and, uh, and kind of provided uh, a means uh, to get accuracies which were not possible with very careful domain specific approaches polished over maybe tens of years. Okay. So the approach at the top level is very simple. You take your complex input X. So this can be a sentence or an image or a sound waveform. And irrespective of the length of the input, you map that sentence, you encode that sentence into a fixed dimensional real vector. So you take your input X and you encode it into a fixed dimensional vector, say maybe 2000 dimensional vector. So now you throw away your input, you don't care about the input. And next, you generate the output tokens. Now the output can be of variable length and you generate the tokens one at a time using a a recurrent neural network, and that generates the tokens one at a time until it encounters a special token. So this special token we are going to call EOS, which is the end of sequence token. So, so this RNN is going to generate, say the first token is always the start of sequence, and then you generate the first word of the sentence, say if you're trying to generate sentences in your output, you feed the first word back into the network and hence the name recurrent neural network, and you generate the second token, so on and so forth, until the last, until you encounter a token, which is this end of sequence token, and that's when you stop. So this is the way in which you are able to generate variable length tokens, because there is a special marker, and when you encounter that marker, you stop generating further tokens. So unlike in earlier, you know, in classical machine learning, you would maybe more like, you know, sample a length from some distribution, and then you generate some output of that length. Here, you kind of just up take this generative view to the prediction task. So, uh, so let's just go a bit more into the details of uh, this encoder-decoder model as applied to the translation task. Okay. 
Okay. So the, the slide is a bit cluttered. So, but we'll just I'll highlight the salient points here. So the input in this case. So we are trying to say do a translation of an English sentence into say a Hindi sentence. So the input consists of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tokens, actually nine tokens because the dot, the last full stop is also a token. So you have nine tokens in the input and the first uh, step is to convert these nine tokens into a real vector. So the first thing you do is to convert discrete words in the vocabulary into a real vector in some fixed dimensional space. So that is an embedding for each of the word. And embeddings of words itself have been very empowering in improving the accuracy of many NLP tasks because earlier, earlier whatever reasoning you would try to do on, on uh, variables which you were thinking of as discrete variables. So you, for each discrete variable, you would need a separate parameter. Now you embed those, those discrete variables into this continuous dimensional space, say maybe 256 dimensional space. So now each word is a vector in some 256 dimensional space. So now you take each of these 256 dimensional real vectors and you feed them one by one into a recurrent neural network. So this network takes as input uh, a vector and it somehow summarizes it in its state. And that state, when it sped the next uh, 256 dimensional vector, generates a new state until you encounter the next end of the input. And the final state is basically the encoding of the input that I was talking about earlier. So now you have generated this fixed dimensional encoding of the input. So we are done with the input now. You can, the input has been encoded into this red state, which is uh, say of size 2000. And now you will be you, conditioning on this state, you will be generating the outputs token at a time. So for, ex so, so, so for generating the outputs, as I said earlier also, we'll be using a recurrent neural network. So this network will take as input the previous, the, 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 the summary of the input and a special token, which actually I've not mentioned here, which is start the generation of student, the, the start of sequence marker, and it will generate the first word. So in this example, say the first word which is generated is hi, okay? And, and now it takes the generated word and feeds that into the next state of the, uh, of the recurrent neural network and that continuing with the state of the input will be used to generate the next word, so on and so forth. So the same uh, thing has been kind of mentioned what I, mean, what I just talked about. So this was the first generation of encoder decoder models. So this was way back in 2014. And uh, in, uh, so, so, uh, so some of, that's when some of the earliest pioneers of deep learning uh, used um, this encoder decoder model to show some successful exam, uh, some su successful use cases in conversation and also in translation. But though the accuracies that you obtained then, then were not surpassing the surpassing the the state of the art accuracy in the domain specific approach. Uh, sort of in each of the individual domains, they were sort of barely competitive. And uh, over the last three years, the amount of research that has happened in deep learning is equivalent to what I would think of as 15 years of research in conventional uh, computer science fields that I am aware of. My, my PhD originally was in databases as I was introduced, you know, my advisor was a database person. I got my PhD in databases. I have been around for a while. And, um, and you know, I have not seen this dizzying pace of development in any other field of computer science. And, uh, but, uh, so, so the amount of work that has gone into this encoder decoder model in the last three years can give you RSI just scrolling through the papers which are on this topic, right? So, so, so what I'm going to do next is to kind of highlight some of the key advances that came out, some of the observed limitations of this encoder-decoder model. 
So, uh, so soon people realized, as you might have felt even when I presented this model, that it seems very kind of uh, very um, foolhardy to try to capture an entire long input irrespective of its length into a fixed dimensional real vector that seems a bit too ambitious. Uh, there are many applications, say if you think about translation and speech recognition, there is a kind of loose alignment between the input and the output. Uh, and you know, very often you can almost do a one-to-one -one mapping between an output token and an input token. And all that facility is lost if you were to just take this entire input and capture into this magical 2000 dimensional vector representation of the input. So we need some mechanism of coming up with this alignment, but as is the style in the deep learning community, we don't want to uh, first learn the alignment through some noise, uh, through some statistical process, which will generate a possibly erroneous uh, uh, alignment, and then try to uh, you know use this alignment to come up with the right input to output mapping. We would like to do this all in an end-to-end -end model. And also, we would like to do it without much feature engineering and hopefully in a way that these ideas that we use for coming up with the input-output alignment will work across communities. And in fact, deep learning researchers did manage to do it and there is a term for it and that is called attention. So with attention, attention is uh, sort of, it seems uh, almost... Uh, quite shallow, but uh, what uh, it tries to do is provide you a mechanism of revisiting the input and the part of the input that you attend to or that you focus on is determined by another layer of neural network uh, components which will be dependent on the current state of your output RNN and each of the input which for which you are trying to decide on whether it is relevant for this current output or not. And uh, based on that, you come up with a weight for each input position and, uh, and then you generate the output with the inputs differentially focused. Okay? And the fun uh, part about uh, this approach is that it's all end-to-end -end differentiable. You can simultaneously learn what to attend on and having decided what to attend on, you can, you can learn how to map that input which is currently being attended on to the corresponding output. That is the whole, uh, whole point. So let's uh, revisit this example. So suppose uh, you know, we, we had this set of uh, nine English tokens. Now with attention, so suppose if you're trying to generate this Hindi sentence, intuitively we know that for the first word, hal, uh, you want to attend, you want to, you know, if you, if you were able to, when generating the word hal, focus on the word recent, which is the seventh word in your uh, sentence, input sentence, you would actually have a, uh, you, you would be doing the right thing. Similarly, when you are generating the token K, perhaps you should be focusing on this area between recent and years. So, uh, 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 and we would like to do this automatically. I mean, it's not like someone has given us a dictionary of English to Hindi words so that we can automatically decide that, okay, Hal should be focusing on recent. Remember that we are simultaneously trying to learn the dictionary and come up with the alignment. And so, so that you do with this attention layer which takes as input the current. So suppose for the first word, you look at the current state of the output RNN or the decoder RNN. And for each of the inputs, you give these two components to a neural network which will assign a real score, which will be used to weight different inputs differentially. And surprisingly, when, frankly, when I first heard of this attention mechanism, I mean, just I'm kind of, I've been working more on conventional machine learning where you have well-defined convex optimization problems. <coughs> When I looked at this particular way of trying to simultaneously do alignment and input to output mapping, I said, no, this cannot work, okay? This, okay, fine, it, it makes sense from a top level formulation point of view, but it will be incredibly hard to optimize. But surprisingly, it does work, okay? 
Okay. So, so here is an example, say, of the kind of attention weights that are generated for a translation from the English sentence. Now these are placed as columns in this matrix to the French words. So I don't know much French, but you can see that in this matrix, you know, the, the, the colors denote the attention weights. You can see that, uh, for example, zone, I mean, zone and area have a high, high weight together, which makes sense. And uh, 1992, of course, is uh, totally focused around 1992. So it has automatically learned this alignment matrix while also trying to learn that area maps to zone and the maps to la and so on and so forth. Okay. So, um, so this is uh, so so this is the the basic technology, and now uh, I will uh, just kind of quickly go over one of the uh, one industry grade uh, implementation of the encoder decoder uh, architecture for translation uh, on uh, in real in reality, and this is a architecture which was uh, described in a famous paper from Google researchers and it's called the Google Neural Machine Translation Model. And uh, this is uh, claimed to be a general purpose architecture which has been applied for translation of many different language pairs. So it's not something which is custom made for a particular pair of languages. And uh, so there are many interesting points about this network. First, the input to the network are not tokens as in words, uh, as so far I have been giving the impression as if the input tokens are words, but rather, you know, in order to handle things like rare words and misspellings uh, uh, and also maybe proper nouns a bit, the words, uh, the what you give as input to the network are word pieces. And uh, then you, you take that the encoding logic is not just one RNN, but a stack of eight RNNs. Uh, the bottom RNN is actually a bidirectional RNN. And when you create this stack of many, many layers of uh, these parameterized uh, uh, you know, functions, uh, you have to really worry about training those parameters. And the parameter training becomes harder as you add more and more layers, makes sense. So what they had to do in order to train parameters in spite of adding so many layers is to create what are called residual connections. So these are very important to make sure that finally whatever optimization function you use for training is able to flow towards lower layers of the network so that they all get trained well. Okay. So there are these residual connections. So this is the encoder part and uh, you know there is this attention uh, logic which consists of two layers of neural network components. And, uh, and then we go to the decoder. The decoder consists of another eight layered RNN uh, architecture. And, uh, and then at finally, you have a sort of a, what is called a softmax layer. But think of the softmax layer as the final layer which assigns a probability distribution, a multinomial probability distribution over all the tokens in your target vocabulary. So, so finally, you will be getting at each time step a probability distribution over the possible tokens at that time step. And you will have to search, you have to pick, you know, so, so at the first time step, you will be getting a probability distribution over all possible words which you can output in the first step. So out of that, you have to pick, you know, one token. And of, you know, of course, you will pick the, the token which has the highest probability. Uh, but maybe that may or may not be correct. So you uh, you kind of hedge your bets and you pick maybe the top K tokens. And that way you maintain like a frontier of promising candidates for generating the final uh, sort of token sequence for an input sequence. So this particular search, I'm kind of not going into this, is called the beam search algorithm. It only approximately generates to you the sequence which has the highest score uh, with respect to the current network. So these are some of the results. Uh, I promised that uh, I'll show how the current deep learning models beat the, the domain specific approaches. So before uh, 
these, uh, say for example, before the GNMT model came around, uh, the state of the art for translation was based on, there was this PBMT, this is phrase-based machine translation system. And what you see on this, uh, for each row, you have different pairs of languages. And uh, the numbers in each of the table is some score which indicates how happy in a qualitative sense are people with the translations produced by each of the three systems. So they compared this conventional phrase-based translation system, which is this domain-specific system, which uses elaborate phase tables and transfer grammars to generate transfer, the, to generate uh, translations. And this is the, here we have the GNMT system, which is what I just described, which is based on this attention-based encoder-decoder network, but heavily engineered with multiple layers of RNNs and actually possible, it, it has like about billions of parameters. It has been trained over weeks. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a beast that way. And uh, then uh, we have uh, on the last column is the translations as generated by humans. And what is interesting is that the GNMT system is much better than the conventional systems and almost as good as the translations which you would get from humans. I mean, of course, this is only for languages which are kind of well endowed in terms of the amount of labeled data that they have. And you may not see that for languages where you do not have enough label data. And in fact, that is one of the, I mean, deep learning works only if you have lots of label data. And these, for these pairs of languages here, that was the case, okay? But for example, when I look at some of the English to Hindi translations, I don't find them to be that great. Uh, so, so, you know, the attention, as I said, it's, you know, the whole, whole, uh, the whole uh, theme of current deep learning research is to try to create technologies which will work across different domains without much feature engineering. So the, ten, tra the attention idea, which I just illustrated for translation, also works for image captioning. So let's say here I am uh, kind of showing the sketch of a model for image captioning. So you are given an input image and you would like to generate a caption of the form, a man is jumping into a lake. So for each token of that you are generating in the output, you would like to focus on specific parts of the input. And so here again, you use attention, but the difference is that now the attention is not over uh, tokens in an input sequence, but over patches of images. So typically, these are patches at some higher level of a neural network. Typically, these are convolutional, convolutional neural networks for processing images. So at some higher level, which is higher level summary of the image, you create attention over patches of the image. <laughs> and the results, of course, as it always is the case for image, uh, topics is visually very pleasing. So let's say here I have an image. Uh, and for that image, you would like to generate, uh, say, a caption of the form, a bird flying over a body of water. Now, if you look at the attention values, which are, uh, which are, which are kind of, uh, which come about when this caption is being generated, it's very interesting. So here I'm showing a sequence of images. And you need to focus on the part of the image which is bright. So that is the attention. So when you are generating words, a bird flying, you see that the bright patch is on the bird. And now towards the end of the image, as we go towards talking about body of water, the bright patch is on the surrounding, it's not on the bird anymore. The bird is now out of focus and the water is in focus. And that was learned automatically, you know, just through an end-to-end -end learning process. Here are more examples. So here you have, uh, say, an image. And uh, say you are generating a caption of the form, a woman is throwing a frisbee in a park. Now, when the underlined word, so in this case, frisbee, when it was generated, this was the attention distribution. So this was the part of the image which was being focused on. And uh, when this particular caption was generated for this image, and at the time that this underlying word dog was generated, 
you see that the attention distribution was very nicely kind of focused around dog. Here is the third example with stop signs. Okay. So you also have uh, attention over speech. So this is uh, an example showing attention at work, work over speech. So on the input here, we have an audio waveform and uh, the output is the sort of the ideal set of uh, characters which, ca which sort of uh, denote the corresponding text. So, uh, so, as, so in the example that I first gave in the motivating slides, I said that you convert a speech waveform into phonemes. But generating the intermediate phoneme form is challenging. It requires a lot more supervision. So in fact, um, uh, state of the art uh, uh, speech recognition systems, which are very data hungry, are able to train their models to directly generate character at a time from an input audio sequence. So what you are generating is not a sequence of phonemes, but actually a sequence of characters. So you generate H, O, W, and then a space, and you M, U, C, H. You know, this is the sequence of characters you generate. And for each character, the corresponding focus is shown by these blue lines. And you see two things. First, uh, as would make sense, for speech, the attention is monotonic, like, you know, because you're not going to cross over. That doesn't make sense for speech. And second is that now, if you look in this speech waveform, there is clearly kind of these patches of silence in the suffix and the suffix and the prefix, and there is no attention on the silence part, and only on the part where there is actually some signal. So uh, again, this is sort of showing the success of attention even for speech recognition tasks. So this was one one area which saw a lot of excitement, and uh, every month you would see somebody applying attention to some or the other task and getting a much better accuracy than they had earlier without attention. But now that has become a bit passe, you know, people are kind of, you know, it has been done. Okay. Then the next big problem with this uh, deep learning models, and I've kind of already alluded to them, is that of course they are very slow to train. I mean, even straight classification models are straight, are slow to train, but these models which are based on sequences as input uh, and output, like say translation systems, they are painstakingly slow because of RNNs. You know, RNNs, they take as input a token and then they do some computation and then they generate a new state and then they are ready to take the next input. So for one, this is an inherently sequential process. You cannot parallelize it easily. And, uh, and also these are very, very slow. I mean, when you think about this eight layer, uh, eight layer neural network, the eight layers of this RNNs, you know, training a translation model can take almost three weeks uh, unless you are really, 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 really GPU endowed, okay? <coughs> so, so compute time is a big issue. And particularly, these models are able to give you respectable accuracy. They beat the state of the art only when they are trained on a huge amount of labeled data. And that is uh, another reason why you really want your models to be efficient. <coughs> so, because RNNs were the bottleneck, so there is one line of research. So there is this paper from Facebook around uh, in ICML last year, where they tried to replace the RNNs with CNNs. And that was considered really uh, a breakthrough because earlier attempts uh, to replace uh, recurrent neural networks with CNNs, CNNs do not do sequential processing, but rather they make passes over the in input in sort of units of windows, maybe of five, six words at a time. <coughs> so CNNs are easy to parallelize. So, so before this Facebook paper, many previous researchers have tried to use CNNs in place of RNNs for various NLP tasks, and they have not been able to beat the state of the art accuracy. But this paper through actually a lot of engineering showed that you can get comparable or even better accuracy using CNNs. 
And while people were excited about it, another paper came along which said that you do not even need CNNs. You can just, just all you need is attention. So this paper created, got a lot of press. And what I'm going to do is kind of quickly describe the main idea of this paper. It kind of, uh, you know, this was like almost a factor of four to five faster than the CNN based approach. And also it offered much higher accuracy. So, uh, so there are two things that we need to do if we want to remove a recurrent neural network from, uh, from processing your input sequence or generating your output sequence. First, we need to assign uh, position information to each of the input. So for that, you know, this is an architecture I am describing which talks about how you can uh, so say, say here again, you continue with our example of encoding this input sequence of tokens. Earlier, we were feeding this input sequence of tokens into an RNN. So when you fed the first token that was captured in some RNN state, and in fact, the RNN state could also remember that economic was the first token. Now, if we do not have an RNN, we have to preserve the position information somehow. So there is another sort of input that you take along with each word which indicates it, it's one hot encoding of its position. And then again, you have a real vector, like a Fourier representation of this integral uh, positional information attached to each word. So this is sort of a Fourier representation. So that gives you a nice continuous space representation of both the word and its position. So these two are combined. And now we have this one vector which captures sort of the essential properties of a word uh, while it is in its current position. So you have both the position and the meaning of the word encapsulated in this one real vector. And now you can sort of, you have done one, one part of the work which the RNN was supposed to do. But the other very important component of say a translation system which uh, RNN fulfills is to extract phrases from say a source language which and because when you do translation I mean earlier also people found that translation is best done in units of phrases and what the RNN would be doing is to extract phrases. Now since you do not have an RNN you need some other mechanism of extracting phrases and there what people found is that you could use attention around each word to find what related words, what words would relate with this word to create a phrasal structure. So this is called self-attention. And now the self-attention is like attention. I won't go into more details of exact mechanics, mechanics in which it is done. But essentially, at the end of it, you come up with a representation at each position of the phrase at that position. I mean, that's what people think it does. So as an example, of how the self-attention works. So suppose if you have this input, you know, this is a input sequence of tokens. And if you look at the self-attention values around uh, individual words, so if you pick a word like say making, so making is connected by arrows of varying weights to other words in the same input. And you find that it has large weight around more difficult, okay? And so, so making of course ha is related to itself and it has a very large weight to more difficult. So once you do that, now you have captured this phrase making more difficult as an internal representation of the input, which you can then process further to do your translation to your target language. So with that, uh, you know, this uh, with that transformation, now this uh, attention is all you need. This was like, a, as I said, a breakthrough paper. They show that, for example, in this task where you are translating from English to German, uh, th there is, a, you know, for translation, you use a blue score. It's a measure of the quality of translation. You they reported a much higher accuracy than all the earlier methods, including the GNMT architecture that I had presented earlier. They get like a two point almost increase in blue score. And similarly for English to French, they get a, a modest jump. 
Okay. But the most interesting thing is that they are able to get state of the art or slightly higher than state of the art accuracy while incurring only uh, you know, one fourth at most of the running time cost of the best previous method. And the best also included a CNN based architecture. And compared to RNN based architecture, we are talking about one to two magnitudes of improvement in running time. So what earlier would require 10 GPUs for training within a week, now you could do in one GPU. So that has been a very big uh, milestone in the state of the art of using uh, sequence models, encoder decoder models for creating translation systems. <coughs> So then the last of the important uh, advances in the last three years I'm going to talk about, and that is fixing some of the issues related to the way in which you train the encoder decoder models. So before, uh, uh, so, 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 so uh, and, and you know, because of the way in which the training has been formulated currently, there are some weird outcomes that you see with existing models. So I'm going to first, show you what are the what are the what are the what are the problematic uh, observations you have with current models and then we'll talk about how we can fix them so one problem which was uh, observed is that um, the current encoder decoder models really are not very good at uh, at creating a sound probability distribution over distributions over sequences which vary a lot in their length. So when you, when you for example, use for translation, typically the, there is uh, some kind of uh, you know, control you have. You can sort of guess pretty well what should be the size, the size of the output sentence, given an input sentence. But for conversation, there is no such handle. You know, the output sequence can be, might have no relationship with the length of the input sequence. And that is where we have observed this huge problem of current encoder decoder models having a length bias. So, uh, so in this graph here, so I'm kind of uh, showing that um, through this graph, what you see here on the x axis is different sequence lengths. So you have sequences of length 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. And on the y axis, you see the fraction of cases in a particular data set, we were looking at a data set from uh, a Reddit comments section, we had created a data set of conversation. And so you're seeing fraction of cases which have that particular length. So in the original data, which is indicated by correct, the blue charts, you find that 25% of the sentences were of length one. So this would correspond to responses of the firm, okay, bye, hi, so on and so forth, okay. and. Um, and then you had, uh, you know, maybe slightly around 30% uh, which were of length two. And uh, there were also a lot of responses which are of length greater than uh, seven. So there were length, okay, you know, around eight. But if you look at the blue, the sorry, the, the orangish yellow colors, which is the encoder decoder models length distribution, you find that almost 25% of the responses were of length zero. You know, this is like, uh, you know, it's just like my son. If you ask him, how was school? <laughs> no response, okay? So, <laughs> so, 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 you know, they, so this is like, you know, the encoder decoder model is actually you're just uh, very, very silent, M more silent than it needs to be. And then it predicts like almost 35% sequences of length one. And it predicts, you know, it severely, severely under predicts large sequences. You see there is no prediction of length greater than four. So of length, you know, greater, you know, around five and more, you see no yellow lines. Okay. So ignore the red line for the moment. These are sort of some fixes that we tried which uh, helped it. And the other problem with the current models is the problem of uh, what I say is that you, you know, kind of you, you invest more in coming up with a better solution and actually you get a lower accuracy. So, uh, uh, so when you, as I said earlier, when you use an encoder decoders model, then finding the 
the, the, you know, you have to choose a particular sequence of tokens from exponentially many solutions. And, uh, and for each token position, you have a score. And the score of a, a position at the tieth, uh, a score of a token at the tieth position is conditioned on the score of, uh, on, on all tokens which have been generated before it. So actually, it's, you cannot find the exact sequence in polynomial time. But you generally do an approximate search, which was the beam search that I was alluding to earlier. And that beam search captures that there is a parameter called beam width, which basically says what is the, what is the number of beams that you are going to care? What is the size of the frontier of intermediate solutions that you are going to maintain? So if beam size is one, you are doing totally greedy decoding. And typically, people use beam size of 10. And people found that, so, so in general, if you use larger beam size, you're getting a solution which has a higher probability by the, by the model. Now you expect that if you increase the beam size, your accuracy should increase. But that was surprisingly not the case. So people have found that as you increase the beam size, for, uh, for longer sequences, actually the accuracy drops. Try not, maybe we'll just skip the trying to understand this chart. But the main thing I want to, uh, want to want you to understand is that as you increase the beam size, accuracy drops and the drop is more for longer sequences. Okay. So why does this happen? So we, I have been kind of very worried about these two problems. You know, why is it that the model has what you would think of as this non-intuitive behavior? And uh, over the last one and a half years, I have identified two reasons. One, actually only recently, like just uh, in the last one month, we have come up with a possible cause, and that is the lack of calibration of these models. So I will describe that next. And then the second uh, reason is the pitfalls of local conditioning. So I'm going to describe each of these shortly. How am I doing on time? Oh, OK, actually I'm. Okay, so let me just uh, stop. I'll just stop by talking about the lack of calibration problem. So, so what, what I mean by that is that, you know, the model at each point in time predicts a probability distribution over the set of possible tokens. A, mod, uh, a, dis, uh, a model which is well calibrated produces probabilities which are perfectly correlated with accuracy. So suppose if I predict that at one position, the probability of end of sequence is 0 0.9, it means 90% of the time it should be correct. But unfortunately, that is not the case with modern deep learning systems. And they, the mo most of the deep learning systems, not just for sequence predictions, tend to be not surprisingly overconfident. They provide very high accuracy, but they are not very reliable. So most of the time they would be happy to say, I think this is a gorilla, and they would be 0.999% sure that it's a gorilla, but actually they are correct only 90% of the time and not 0.999% of the time, and 99.99% of the time. So that afflicts even sequence models. And this chart we show that, um, you know, so suppose here, if you, on the x-axis is the confidence output by the model, on the y-axis is accuracy, a perfectly calibrated model would lie on this 45 degree line, but this blue line is the model which the, the, the kind of behavior you see between probability and accuracy that the encoder-decoder model, well-trained encoder-decoder model, including the GNMT models have. They are kind of overconfident. If you are below the 45 degree line, then you are overconfident. And we identified one of the main reasons why they are overconfident, and that is they are you know, particularly overconfident on the end of sequence token. So this is what these slides are showing. And then we have come up with a fix for this overconfidence so one of these is the overconfidence on the end of sequence token, but also we found that it is, it is particularly poorly calibrated when the attention values are diffused. Makes sense in retrospect. And so we have a fix, and with the fix, we have been able to calibrate the models significantly. So the green line is the model that we have obtained after we have retrained with our methods of calibration. And now we find that the beam search is better behaved. And uh, you know you see also that the accuracy improves. We'll not go into that. And I'm going to skip this part and uh, 
so a complete summary. So, uh, so basically, uh, what I wanted to sh uh, to uh, say in this talk is that um, in the last three years, there has been a lot of exciting research in pushing the state of the art for sequence prediction models. And uh, now with the state of the art models, there is, uh, you know, the, the, this communities, speech recognition communities and image processing communities, which were earlier, NLP communities, which were earlier in, the, on, in their own silos have come together and uh, they are getting uh, accuracies which have been not possible with their domain specific approaches. And, uh, but there are sort of, you know, many things to be done uh, in the future. And what personally I am most interested in is to move away from models which are like black box models, which is currently the state of the art, which are batch trained one time monolithic models. I would like to create models which are more transparent and which allow more control. For example, if I already have a large dictionary of translations, why can't I use that? If I already have a very good idea, if I've already created a grammar, how can I incorporate that and create models which can, which can work along, which can best use uh, existing domain expertise. And also I would like to create models which are trained continuously and not in a one-time mode. So, so that we are, so these models behave in a way which is, which makes them closer to how human beings learn uh, various recognition tasks. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I kind of <laughs> over short time. Thank you, Professor, for a wonderful talk. So we have, we can take a couple of questions, maybe two, three. You can just raise your hands. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question here. So actually, I totally agree that they are going to come back. I feel now the next set of uh, you know, breakthroughs will come out of the skillful integration of domain-specific uh, you know, ideas. You know, I, I, I really, that is what I wanted to say at the end, that we really need a method to move away from these black box models and to try to incorporate uh, you know, known expertise into these models. I, they, they absolutely have to come back. I don't think, you know, we can stay with, this is to me very unsatisfactory, this kind of black box models. They can, you know, uh, so now what? So, so that's my question. It's like, you know, it's like a dog chasing a car. You know, once you have reached the car, now what? So I kind of feel that, okay, yeah. so, so we are done. We got all this data and now you have bit. Now, how do you go further? How do you know when you are wrong? What do you, can, is there no way to improve it any further? And the only way around I see to improve any further is to break open the box. Uh, good afternoon, Professor. Yes. The question is basically you made a statement like uh, sequencing models are painstakingly slow yes. to train, right? And simultaneously, we very well do understand that uh, there are claims being made that Murray's law is going to be dead within a few years. We have been hearing this statement since last 10 years, and uh, we really pray that it should not die. Then what is the future of deep learning in that way? Because if computation is the challenge, then uh, what? So I think the future will, I say one of the reasons I feel why deep learning models are so slow is because they are just basically throwing the baby with the bath water. You, they are not making use of features when they are indeed available. And you know, the way attention is encoded, I don't like the, the number of layers behind which attention is encoded. Can we have it more transparent? I s believe that with more research and with better design, we can significantly improve the running time of deep learning models. Currently, they are so slow because people did not think about uh, making use of domain expertise and also making use of good design principles. They kind of, I feel we are just sort of in the, uh, at the beginning of uh, a much more fun and uh, 
uh, sort of um, much more, uh, I think, wise use of resources. I, I kind of really, it pains me that a lot of deep learning research is basically targeted towards selling more GPUs. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's going to carry on for so long. We will build models which are factor, you know, order of magnitude faster. So the requirement is to build better models. So hardware is not a bottleneck as per your statement. No, I'm saying that uh, if we continue with the current mindless space, hardware will become the bottleneck, but I'm hoping that better design will prevail. So we'll take this last question. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes. Uh, my name is Aditya, and I am a student of Triple IT Nagpur. My question is about image captioning. Uh, I was recently reading an article based on the uh, Google DeepMind's uh, ca captioning tool, and it turned out that it could be exploited. The researchers uh, printed some 3D models with different identification spots, and they could easily fool the image captioning tool to believe that what significantly seemed to be a turtle is actually something else. Yes, yeah. So uh, my question, I want to question that how and why can this be exploited and what is the, what is the way to correct this thing? Yeah, so actually there is a huge community of people now who are working on this problem of adversarial attacks. And uh, so the reason they can be exploited is because the deep learning models have been uh, to a large extent kind of overfitted on the examples and uh, on the training examples. So, so you can, and you know, ultimately these are just continuous functions. If you understand how that function behaves, then you can, uh, you can kind of reverse engineer to give input which will fool that function. So there are, so this is actually a topic of active research now. If you just search for adversarial attacks, adversarial training, adversarial ex example creation, just like last NIPS, there have been several papers on this topic. There was also a workshop. So yeah, there is no one correct crisp answer. This is an ongoing topic of research. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. I guess uh, let me honor one more request from yes. the back there. Yeah. Apologies for adding in one more question. Hello, ma'am. Uh, yes. Just one question from my side is that can we apply the same, the same this model to the code mix languages? Means if the two yes. or three more languages are there, can we apply the same thing? Yes, yeah. I mean, if you have enough training data, that is, yeah. But without training data, how without much training data of code mixed language, an interesting research question is, if you already have lot of label data in each of the individual languages, so if you have lot of Hindi and lot of English separate label data, can you use it for training uh, sort, sort of to, to do interpretation of code mixed languages? That is also a topic of active research. Many people I know, some of my colleagues are also working on this problem. If you're interested, I can give you their contacts. Yeah. Yeah, with this, I'll request all of you to join me to thank our speaker today, Professor. So I'm sure indeed all of us are having a great knowledge feast, right? But at the same time, we need a lunch break. Yes, so it's a lunch break time, and we'll be back again uh, to continue our knowledge feast at 2 o'clock. Lunch will be served in cafeteria. Thank you.